here we go again, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Bloomberg's The Fed Decides starts right now. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Bloomberg Surveillance, The Fed Decides. Back in the hot seat alongside Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity mark on the S&P 500 negative through the month of April. Coming into May and starting off a little bit softer. That decision is about 27 minutes away. Ramo, 30 minutes after that, a news conference with Chairman Powell. Key question is, which paragraph is going to change? People are going to be parsing through the language, including Tom Keane, who's very eager to figure out exactly whether it's the first or the seventh paragraph that's shifted. Basically, how much are we looking at a Fed that has shifted away from disinflation is continuing according to their pace and moving toward cuts aren't going to come till much later. TK, we've talked about this a million times. Everyone is expecting him to be hawkish in this news conference. We said through this morning, hawkish relative to what? Relative to the previous meeting, low bar. Relative to what he said already previously and what is priced, a much higher bar. I'll go back to the higher bar, but what I'm going to go back to is when the facts change, the market change. We start with Bob Michael, which is great because, John, we go into this meeting, the market has changed. I got a 10-year real yield since you and I had our extravagant lunch 2.29%. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a runaway 10-year real yield in fixed income animals. That's their focus. Chairman Powell has one gear. Does he need to find a new gear? This stat from Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank is an important one. The two-year note has rallied on all of the last four FOMC days. Bramo, will today be any different? Basically, this is a Fed chair that has leaned dovish consistently. Will he continue to or will he actually come out and say the H word? Hike. Entertain it. Discuss it. Embrace it. Mm. Talk about maybe things getting a little bit concerning, given the fact that inflation has been accelerating. In certain I'm quarters. transfixed by my, my nominee for Economist of the Year, Lindsay Piegza at Stiefel, who says get out front and raise rates. But I see no template for him to do that today or to even hint it. You know, that we need to see lots of Fed okay. speak, John, to get there. Just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that he hike rates today. Just even entertain the idea. <laughs> That's what I'm talking the about. You two have been apart for so long. That's <laughs> how know. bearish TK thinks you really are. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's get to the scores. Equities on the S&P 500 negative here by a quarter of 1%. In the bond market over the last few months, we've done a lot of work. Since the Fed last met, the two-year yield was 460. At the moment, Lisa, it's just north of 5%. And there's really a question about some of the data that's coming in, and we can get to that in a second, showing weaker activity but still hot inflation. Coming up, we'll parse all of this with Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan, as Tom was mentioning, then Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab and Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank, all taking us up to that 2 p.m. Fed rate decision, which may or may not be interesting, depending on which paragraph gets changed and how much. Then we'll get immediate reaction. Mohammed El Arian of Queens College, Cambridge, KPMG's Diane Swank, Bank of America's Michael Gapin, <coughs> all be talking until Fed Chair Jay Powell takes the hot seat, whether he is hawkish or whether he remains his sort of dovish self. We'll see. And then after that, we're going to talk with former New York Fed President Bill Dudley and BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg. Really curious to see how much, really, to your point, John, we're going to end up getting some sort of true hawkish shift at a time when some people speculate the market needs to sell off more for them to achieve their goal. We've got two guests on the show today, John, who really need a victory lap. Mohammed El Arian and Bill Dudley nailed the last three years. Is this how absolutely you set up our next nailed. guest? <laughs> no, but, but they absolutely nailed. They took a lot of grief for a high-yield call. Bob Michael's about to walk off the set. Bob Michael <laughs> and J.P. Morgan Asset Management joins us now. Bob, good We called for you. high yields back in 2021. <laughs> what are you Here talking we go. about? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Crushed it. And you know what? When, when you were talking about, I'm not calling for rate hikes, the first thing I thought about was if this were the Volcker era, we would be talking about rate yes. hikes because he yes. very well could have walked in today and hiked rate 50 basis points. And you know, we wouldn't have known because we'd have to look at open market operations and see how much liquidity they drink. Perfect but setup. That's not the environment we're in. How different is this environment for Chairman Powell? Oh, it's got to be a little bit different. He's got to change that first paragraph. It talks about over the last year, inflation has eased but remained moderate. Take out the has eased over the last year and just say it remains elevated. He also talked about economic activity continuing at a solid pace. Take out solid pace and just say economic activity is expanding. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. You have to acknowledge that disinflation has stalled and prices remain elevated 
And you also have to acknowledge that while businesses and households look okay, they're not as vibrant as they were three, four months ago. In your research note, you talked 1995. And I want you to bring it over to the equity market where there's worry with a 4.5% drawdown. I recall in 1995, and you do as well, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 4,000. And we did a one-way shot X 1998 out to Dow 10,000 as well. Are we setting ourselves up for an equity market of what the Fed is doing like 1995? We're in a pretty similar space. I'm surprised 95 doesn't get more airtime because that's the one soft landing anybody could have lived through unless they're 100 years old. And in that time frame, when you look at what actually happened, the Fed stopped hiking rates in February they cut rates in July, but if you go back to that May meeting, they were talking about uncomfortable levels of inflation, both surprising and unwelcome. And it seems like we could be talking about the same thing for this meeting. There's sort of a key question underpinning exactly how Fed Chair Powell messages this. The question being, how much does he need the market to sell off a little bit more? How much does it actually help his cause that we saw a sell off in April? And does he want that to continue? Do you expect him to lean into that? Or is he going to come out, try to, and still be like, oh, we're still going to cut rates? I don't think he's going to say that. I think he wants to be balanced. I think he actually has the market to where he would like to see it, given the data that's printed over the last six weeks. You've got one rate cut priced in for the year, and that's towards the back end of the year. You've got 50 basis points higher in 10-year yields over the past month. Those are all things that should be reflected with inflation where it is. So try to find the balance. Talk about elevated inflation pressures and maybe the opportunity to reduce rates when those come down. Is this an exciting meeting, or is this basically a placeholder before June? No, I think this is an exciting meeting. I think since you the, can come back. I, I think <laughs> since the last meeting, you're talking about growth has tailed off a little bit. We had a 1.6% GDP print. When you start looking at some of the stress in the lower income brackets of households, and middle market corporate America, they're feeling some pressures. It's not the vibrancy we've seen. And we're not supposed to be printing around 3% inflation. We're supposed to be printing about 2% inflation now, and we're not seeing that. So he's got to address that. And then there's that minor detail of quantitative tightening. They're still running down the balance sheet at a pretty high pace. Why not use this meeting to tell us that they're going to taper? They're going to reduce Treasury sales by half at one of the upcoming meetings. Is that your base case today? Do we get that announcement? We think we do. And if you go back 13 months, I think it surprised a lot of people that as the regional banking system was imploding, they still went ahead and hiked rates. But they talked about policies to the side of that. And I think they could do that here. They could talk about balance sheet management is different from their dual mandate of inflation and growth. Can I ask you what difference that will make if they do slow down the taper of QT, or rather speed up the taper of QT? What does that actually mean? I, I think psychologically it will help the market support at these levels because if you think about the largest sellers of treasuries, it is the US Treasury and it's the Fed and otherwise Everyone pretty much is a net buyer. So if you're removing half of one of the largest sellers of treasuries, that's got to be the source of some support, even if it's only psychological. This is what everyone struggles with. And, Bramma, we've talked about this a million times. We've been told QT is just like paint drying. And then all of a sudden, when you start to unwind some of the QT, apparently it matters psychologically. Can you get your head around that? Basically, how do they end quantitative tightening without having a dovish signal? without giving the market some sort of sign that they're concerned about overly tightening the market. And so it becomes psychologically important to a market that's trying to understand supply and demand dynamics. This, I think, is a sort of an issue. Bob Michael, over to you. How do you uh, they do that? Be because they separate those two and they say they can walk and chew gum at the same time. And, and balance sheet management is one thing and dealing with growth and inflation pressures is another thing. I also think when you look at 
the selling uh, of treasuries and the running down of the balance sheet, it actually didn't do all that much to the treasury market, to be honest. The entire treasury curve is still trading well below the Fed funds rate. I'm going to Japan in a week and a half. I know when I get there, the conversation will be about what is the alternate reserve currency to the dollar. The answer yep. is there is none. Who isn't going to Japan at the moment? I know. I know, seriously. 150 and dollar yen, everyone's going to Japan. Cherry blossoms. It's beautiful. Good energy. I get it. Everyone talks about it. You going to Japan? No, I am. Bob's going to go see Tarnaga and tell him what to do <laughs> forward. You've been watching Shogun? Yeah, I love oh. it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> High-end program. Really we need to talk. Amazing. It's great. We need to talk. It's amazing. It's great. You know, I, JP Morgan <laughs> finance Tarnaga. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs>gone from expecting six or seven rate cuts to, to maybe two. Seven Fed cuts. Cutting rates in June, June or July. The second part of the year. Surgical rate cuts. Predicting when that rate cut might happen. There's really only one, one and a bit left for the year. The longer that these rate cuts are postponed, the more credence we get to the possibility of rate hikes. That last mile in inflation. I think they're trying to say this is a bump in the road. Maybe bump is the new transitory. I don't think Chappelle's going to rule out anything. Powell will aspire to be the most boring he possibly can. It would be very, very difficult um, for, the, for the Fed to deliver anything short of a hawkish message. He will be sort of just as hawkish as he was week before last. Really, if he opens his mouth, there's all downside risk. How patient will they be to get down to their policy objectives? You could get an environment where the economy stays resilient, um, but inflation just stays much stickier than, than expected. They're in a tricky spot. I think the Fed's got to try to buy time here. They're between a rock and a hard place. Claudia Sam did her best to cancel this news conference that takes place <laughs> in about 45 minutes' time. Been joking all week. Is that the promo for this? <laughs> He's going to try to be as boring as possible. Stay tuned. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't you speak. Should, you should play this every day because, <laughs> because it's a parlor game. I'm sorry. Everybody's got an opinion. All that matters is one guy's opinion. Just keep that on repeat, TK. Here are the scores. Going into that Fed decision, 14 minutes away. Equities on the S&P 500, negative by a quarter of 1%. We're down six tenths on the Nasdaq. The Russell got absolutely battered in the month of April, down 7% on a small caps. Brutal. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. We've done some work since the Fed last met on a two-year. We were at 460. The time the Fed met before that, 420. So we're up another 40 basis points between meetings, a two-year at 5.01%. And are you up late in Tokyo? Hello, Ministry of Finance over in Japan. You're probably looking at this one. Dollar yen. Dollar yen at the moment, 157.57. Tom, this is just as important for the Japanese Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance in Japan as it might be yeah. for the Treasury and the U.S. economy. And I go to Beijing as well because you've got to look at other things besides dollar yen, euro yen, 168. You wonder if that breaches through to a weaker yen. But what I'd look at is yen yuan, the, the number of Chinese yuan per uh, Japanese uh, yen. And I'm sorry, it's a massive move. It's a 30% move off the off the uh, yen strength of, of long ago. Joining us to discuss is Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank, alongside JP Morgan, Bob Michael. Matt Lazzetti, I know we've only got a few minutes with you, so I want to come to you first. Your call now is December, one cup this year. What can Chairman Powell possibly say that's hawkish, given what's already in the price, given what you already think is going to happen this year? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that there's a lot of hawkish expectations. Speaking with clients, there's, you know, talk or questions about whether or not they drop the easing bias. Um, you know, whether or not he actually talks about hikes and opens up that possibility. I don't think we get those types of hawkish signals. I think, you know, he sounds a lot like he did uh, about two weeks ago, which is hawkish relative to where it was in March. I think the things that I'll, I'll be focused on up front are, are two things. One, in the statement, do they adjust the forward guidance language or do they adjust how they're thinking about the balance of risks? And then in his opening remarks, does he continue to say uh, that they think they're at the peak policy rate and that the next move this year is likely to be, be a rate cut? I think he probably does maintain all of the, those things. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think he talks about data dependence. Um, you know, they're probably comfortable, yeah. I think, with mar market pricing is at the moment. Matt, the market's moving. The 10-year real yield, 2.29%. We almost got to 2.30% when Bob Michael was beaten up. And the answer is that's a high inflation-adjusted yield. What does that mean for the American economy? 
Yeah, you know, I think when we had reached these levels or even higher levels previously, uh, and as you had a, this big tightening of financial conditions, the expectation was that you would see this material slowdown in the economy. It just hasn't happened as of yet. And, and even though we did have a slowdown in Q1 with GDP growth at 1.6%, if you look at the domestic economy, you know, consumer spending, residential investment, capex, it grew 3% annualized, a very sturdy number. You know, the consumer printed 2.5% in the first quarter. So I, I think, yes, you know, these things do look tight historically. But at the same time, we're not seeing very clear and convincing evidence that the Fed is uh, uh, sufficiently restrictive in order to get inflation down. I love how everyone's trying to dissect each paragraph and which is going to be the most important to really pay attention to, Matt. And you do that very well as you try to get a sense of what to pay attention to. Why do you not think they're going to talk about ending quantitative tightening? Why do you think that they're going to push that back, even though some, including Bob Michael, who's here on set with us, thinks they're probably going to address it and start tapering that? Yeah, you know, I, I do think that there's good prospects that they do that today. So essentially, they've given us a lot of signals that this decision is upcoming. When you look at the minutes to the March meeting, it seems like they were agreed on all of the key parameters. And so why not just go ahead with it? I think from my perspective, that there's two things. One, there's no urgency in making the change at this meeting. You know, they've been focused on things like the overnight reverse repo facility, and that actually has risen recently. So we're not close to reserve scarcity at the moment. The second thing is I would be concerned about easing financial conditions in this environment. And if the only uh, kind of decision that comes out of this meeting is a slowing in the pace of QT, I think that's a problem from, from the Fed's perspective. And so I see very little downside for delaying to, to June, doing it at a time where they can pair it with a, a more hawkish leaning dot plot. And so our baseline is that that happens. But I would, I would agree. I think it's you know, very easy to see that they actually do slow the pace of QT today. Hey, Matt, good to hear from you. Matt Lazzelli at Deutsche Bank going into this decision 10 minutes away. That final comment there, Bramo, you've said that repeatedly over the last few weeks. Is there a concern that they send one message that's more dovish than they'd like uh, by saying, you know, we want to end some of the quantitative tightening? At the same time, why not go ahead with this? Because they can walk and chew gum at the same time, evidently. Let's get to Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Kathy, Bob Michael's with us, and he mentioned the statement. If we can just go to the first paragraph of the previous statement, there's two lines in it Bob mentioned. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. They say this on inflation. Inflation has eased over the past year but remains elevated. When we open this statement up in about nine minutes' time, Kathy, are you expecting that opening paragraph to get a heavy edit? Well, I think there'll be some edit to it. I think you could still describe the economy expanding at a solid pace because solid means it's expanding, right? And we did get, you know, 3%, 2.1% uh, growth in the first quarter in domestic demand. So I think that that, that, can, be, that can be the same, uh, the same statement. As for, you know, the signaling on, uh, you know, inflation and where we're going from here, I, I think that that's where we're probably going to see the changes to the, to the statement. I mean, it's very hard to parse through this ahead of time, but I would guess that it does get a heavy edit in the, in the second sentence. The markets are moving, Kathy, and we've got a 2.29, almost 2.30% 10-year real yield. I'm sorry, that changes everything for American uh, business. Does the Fed cognizant of that? Are they aware of a real yield running away? Oh, I'm sure they are. And I'm sure that they would have thought that elevated real yields at this stage of the game would probably slow the economy more than it has. Um, we've, we've continued to see business investment stay pretty healthy. But, you know, when I look at the, I, I think what's puzzling right now is you look at the um, comments from the regional Fed banks about business activity and consumer spending, and they're a little downbeat. They're not negative, but they're much more likely to say um, growth uh, expanded slightly or modestly and rather than strongly or even moderately. And yet then we get the aggregate numbers and they're, they're pretty healthy. And I think that the Fed would have expected by now that high real rates would have slowed the economy more. Obviously, there, there are reasons you could point to, like fiscal policy having mm -hmm. been more expansive uh, as a reason that it's taken longer to have an impact. But yeah, real rates still count. I, I think that we're starting to see that with consumers and credit cards and, and auto loans and certainly mortgage rates. Kathy, this is a highly data-dependent Fed. They've said that many times. Of course, it's tricky to know which data they're actually looking at and exactly how they're going to weigh it. We got ISM manufacturing earlier, and it came in lower than expected in contractionary territory, but prices paid came in at the hottest pace going back many months. This raises a question 
question, where does the Fed place the emphasis in terms of its mandate? Do we get a sense of that today in the news conference? If there is, I don't want to say the S word, stagflation, and I feel like this is kindergarten with all the different words that we can't say, but is this something that they're going to address with keeping rates higher for longer, higher rates, or are they going to say we care about the economy most of all and don't want to keep it? We want to keep it going for as long as we can. It's pretty obvious that they've focused right right now on inflation because economic growth has been you know, pretty sturdy. If they were to shift that emphasis, I think it would be due to a decline in the job market, you know, a real a problem in the, in the job market where uh, job growth really tailed off and we saw the unemployment rate rise. Because that tends to happen, when it happens, it tends to move pretty quickly. And that would be a very clear signal that they're not meeting that, that mandate of full employment. Right now, they can sort of ignore the ups and downs in the economy to some extent because the aggregate numbers still show a healthy economy, even though manufacturing has struggled for quite some time. Uh, but it's when job growth deteriorates that they really have to switch the focus to just fighting inflation to back to that dual mandate. Bob, what do you make of that? This idea that, and I don't want to say stagflation, but sort of stagflationary light types of trends where you get slowing growth but still sticky inflation that seems to be in some corners even accelerating. I think we're legging into a broader base slowdown. I think you are seeing some slowdown in businesses and households. I think they are struggling with the higher price of everything and the higher cost of funding those higher prices. And that will continue to put downward pressure on the economy. Ultimately, that will start to bring inflation down again and will we'll return to disinflation. As I hear Matt and Kathy talk, it, it reminds me that the Fed has to be careful not to be too hawkish and push everything to one side of the boat because real yields are high. And I don't believe this Fed has given up on the long and variable lags. I think they've been pushed out a bit. I think they will have to come in by year end and cut rates a few times to stabilize the economy. But I think they have to be careful not to be too hawkish. And maybe that's where you fit QT, tapering QT back in. You offset some of the hawkish rhetoric with, we're going to start reducing Treasury sales. So what do you make of this? Three-month average for payrolls, 276. Estimate for Friday, 240. Bank of America, 250. Morgan Stanley, 250. Goldman, 275. What do you make of those kind of numbers? What do they mean? Quits rate prints a new cycle low. Correlation of quits rate to wage gains is nearly perfect historically. So wages are coming down. We know that there is a new recently unmeasured supply of workers coming into the market through immigration. That should help. So basically you're saying that that's noise and that the signal is the quits rate and that's actually the more important thing, especially because that gives you a sense of a slowdown that maybe the distorted numbers might not give. I think you have to look at unemployment. I think that's a real number and does that go above 4%? And you have to look at wage gains. That's the other real number. I think the number of employed, whether it's up 275 or up 240, I think that's misleading. Kathy, I wanted to give you a final word on that, the labour market. It's a similar question to the one Lisa asked a little bit earlier in the conversation. Where should you place the emphasis? More specifically, within the labour market, looking at the data, how much weight should you put on payrolls on Friday compared to, say, the jolt numbers we got a little bit earlier? Well, I would agree with, uh, with Bob that the wage gains are what to look at, because if you're worried about the labor market's influence on inflation, it has to be, the mechanism has to be through wages. So um, we did also note that the JOLTS number um, is correlating with, would correlate with lower wage growth, probably closer to 3% than 4%. And it's our expectation that that will happen over time. So I think the, the emphasis has to be on wage gains rather than on just the nominal growth in jobs. Kathy, this was great. It's good to hear from you. Kathy Jones there of Charles Schwab going into that Fed decision two and a half minutes away, 30 minutes after that, news conference with Chairman Powell. Bob Michael itching to get in. Bob, your thoughts? I wanted to ask her what she's telling clients to do she's in their gone portfolios. Now. What are you telling clients to do? What are you actually doing? This is your chance to get in. Buy at 2.29% real yields, buy the backup in credit spreads. We're in a soft landing. You're going to get conflicting messages. The Fed will be confused. 
it's OK. Do clients feel like it's a second chance, another bite of the October apple, so to speak? Do they feel that yeah, way? Yeah, absolutely. See when I was here a couple of weeks ago, I talked about a washout into month end into the FOMC meeting. We're having that. Let's put some cash to work. Let's put some cash to work. You're two year right now, just north of 5%. Yields coming in a couple of basis points. That decision two minutes away. Let's go through the price action together and start with the equity market. We'll go through the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, the Russell. Think about how we started last month. We came out of March and into April and everyone started to say it's time to get into the rotation. Look outside of mega cap tech. Look to small caps, for instance. The Russell Lisa in the month of April got absolutely hammered. These are the companies more leveraged to rate staying higher for longer. They get more impact, uh, impacted from that. So it raises this question, can you get a rotation trade with rates staying where they are? Some people, like uh, what we heard from Max Kettner today, was like, yeah, great, buy everything, because you know what, they're high for the right reasons, and that seems to be I'm going to go where Bob is, and Ian Lingen's talking about this at BMO Capital Markets as well, this idea of getting out front, buy, yield now, price up, yield down is the, is the main issue. And the reason we're having this debate right now is we're begging for a Fed, John, to get out front and be ex-ante. There's no evidence whatsoever that any major central bank can ex ex ante at their peril. They're going to be ex post. They're going to wait and wait and wait. And then finally, Bob Michael will have a payday. This afternoon, and we hope he gets that payday. We hope he shares it too. This afternoon, it is price up, yield down, going into this decision. Let's bring up the bond move and look at the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year. The 10-year is down about four basis points on the session. These are the scores. 464.27 becomes 464.48. The two-year, 5.01%. Down two basis points on the day, up 40 since the Fed last met. If you switch up the board and finish on foreign exchange going into this Fed decision, hello dollar yen. This is one to watch. This is not just about America, it's about the rest of the world as well. Dollar yen at the moment approaching 158, 157, 64. With your Fed decision, it's Mike McKee. Short and simple, a change in the statement, but no change in rates. The economic overview remains the same, word for word, with solid growth, strong job gains, and inflation that's eased over the past year, but remains elevated. And then a new line. In recent months, there has been a lack of further progress toward the committee's 2% inflation objective. Still, the statement says, risks to achieving its employment and inflation goals have, quote, moved toward better balance over the past year, putting the assessment in the past tense and adding over the past year. The additions to the statement would seem to ratify the market's view that there will not be three rate cuts this year, if any at all. The statement's view that the committee does not believe it would be appropriate to reduce rates until it's gained further confidence, inflation is moving toward target, is unchanged. Now, the long-awaited balance sheet taper is here. The Treasury roll-off cap will drop from $60 billion to $25 billion a month starting on June 1st. Officials had suggested it would be lowered to $30 billion. As expected, no change in the $35 billion cap on mortgage-backed securities. However, any maturing securities over the cap will be reinvested in Treasuries rather than MBS. The vote, unanimous. And that's it. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Stay close. Let's run through this price action. Mike McKee's going to run into that news conference in just a moment. Equities recovering just a little bit, still down on the session by a tenth of 1%. Your attention, of course, immediately turning to what's happening in the bond market. In the bond market at the moment, the rally sticks. Yield to lower by four basis points on a 10-year, 464, on a two-year, down three, just about holding on to that 5% level. Lots of attention in the FX market and what's happening with dollar yen. Bit of yen strength off the back of this. Dollar yen back down to 157.54. It was always going Going to be difficult to outhawk what was already very hawkish pricing in this market. Bear in mind, though, this is the first act of a two part story. The other act is in about 28 minutes' time when we hear from the Federal Reserve Chairman. So, do you want to play compare and contrast? I think we could do that, Bramo, briefly. I'll go through this. It might sound a little boring, but every word seems to matter. The last statement, the first paragraph, read as follows. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. Job gains have remained strong and the unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation has eased over the past year, but remains 
elevated. That first paragraph has changed. This is how it reads now. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a solid pace. Job gains have remained strong and the unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation has eased over the past year but remains elevated. In recent months, there has been a lack of further progress towards the committee's 2% inflation objective. I just wonder how long the conversation was, Bramo, in the FOMC to agree to that last line of that first paragraph. You know, I wonder, because the, the discussion among Fed officials who did speak in the week before the quiet period was more hawkish. People seemed genuinely concerned. I don't think that maybe there was disagreement with this. I just wonder how much conviction Fed Chair Powell will have in this news conference to really build on that and say just how much less conviction they have and just how much they're going to do to offset some of the lack of progress. I think they've got to wait for more economic data and the bottom line, John, you quoted off Jobs Day. Do we link right now to, to Friday's Jobs Day? I'm sorry we do. There's, there's no real indication here of the labor market cracking. Jolt survey today was a little weak. Bob Michael mentioned that, but I just, I just think they have to wait. They're in massively exposed position. Fantastic lineup going into the news conference. Bob Michael is still with us. Joining us now, pleased to say, good friend of this program, good friend of ours, Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, you've had a few minutes to go over this one. What jumps out? Three things, John. One is the characterization of growth is stronger than I would have expected. Two is the reduction in QE is larger than I expected. And then finally, um, that additional sentence they've put in about inflation is going to put Chair Powell in a difficult situation at the press conference because people are going to say, OK, finish the sentence. It's been too, it has, the progress hasn't been achieved. Why? Is it something temporary? Is it something structural? So they've left wide open the question of why has progress been, been less than they expected on the inflation front. Mohammed, if I look at this press conference, this is a central banker with an original script and not much theory involved at all. Can he get out front of the debate ex ante, or is this an ex post discussion? Tom, I'm really glad you raised it. This is an ex post discussion. This is a Fed that, having been burnt by trying to be ex ante back in 2021, has become totally ex post, totally data dependent, totally reactive. Um, and that is a problem for the economy. That is a real problem for the economy. So, no, he's going to remain exposed. We're going to hear data dependency, I don't know how many times, during the press conference. Which raises this question, which data matters more? We were talking about data that we got earlier this morning about ISM manufacturing showing weakening activity, to your point about the surprise and how much uh, they had conviction and strength, but also stickier inflation that came in higher than expected with prices paid. How will this Fed view that data that I don't want to say stagflation because I've said it so many times and I'm sure people will be making fun <laughs> of me for that. But I am wondering if this is sort of not ideal for them and if they'll respond more to the inflation side or the economy side. So I call it stagflationary wins. Thank you. Okay? That's, That's good. <laughs> um, you, 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 I mean, I, I can live with stagflation or light that you use, but stagflationary wins. They're not going to acknowledge that because it puts a question front and center, which is what is the right inflation target for an economy that's going through fundamental supply side changes. Um, you know, if you look at what is sticky in inflation, it's not particularly responsive to higher interest rate for longer. It really isn't. So if they acknowledge the softer economy, they end up having to then discuss, at least internally, whether 2% is a right inflation target. And a phrase that John did not read out in the statement is they are strongly committed, strongly committed to returning inflation to its 2% target. Give me a chance, Mohammed. I was just itching to get to you, to get your reaction. But Michael with us as well. You're going to run I with think, that phrase. I think Hilarion just threw you under I the think, bus. I think he did. I, mean, I, just, you, I think he you did. You failed, John. Can no. we get Mohammed back up? I was going to turn to Bob Michael and get his thoughts. What's great about this is you at, least, you at least okay. read the statement. Hold on I a don't. second. But that was in it before. It wasn't the more notable thing. It wasn't struck out. It didn't change, John. That's the reason why. Fact, I've never read a statement. <laughs> Continue. I believe you. <laughs> you didn't even need to tell us that. Mohammed, what are you doing to me? I don't know. Bob Michael, great friend of this program. Bob, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Bob, your thoughts on this one? As Michael McKee was reading through the commentary, I thought, boy, this is really good for the markets. 
because here is a Fed that's telling us, look at the longer term. Look where inflation was and look where we've gotten it to. Don't worry about the last couple of months. We'll see what happens there. I actually think that's the right message. I don't believe the law of long and variable lags has been repealed. I think they've been delayed because of all the f fiscal stimulus that's still in the pipeline, but they're still there. You are seeing some pressures on the economy. Like Mohammed, the only thing I was surprised about is that they ca characterize the economy as still solid. Yeah, I, I look, Mohammed, I want to bring this up. I brought it up earlier with Bob Mike. I'm going to do it with you right now. I don't know where you were in 1995, maybe at the White House, Mohammed, maybe IMF. But the answer is Bob Michael says there's whispers here of 1995. The stock market was a moonshot off of the success of 1995. Is that what we are prepared for here, that they may get this right? We may have a constructive 1995 and up we go? So where I agree with Bob without any qualifications is that this particular statement is something that the markets will like. It's exactly what the market wanted. Um, as to are we going to repeat 95 in terms of market reaction? Tom, what I'm worried about, because I truly believe that this is not about lags, that there are structural aspects that are running the equilibrium inflation rate higher than it has been in the past. I worry that the Fed is going to be over tight this year. I worry that the Fed is not going to end up cutting because they're going to be so data dependent, so reactive, that they're not going to look at the weakness that's coming. In fact, if you simply read the earnings reports of McDonald's, Starbucks, PepsiCo, Nestle, the list goes on, there is no doubt that low-income consumers are struggling that balance sheet effects have gone from positive to negatives, the pandemic savings are run down, the credit card balances are high, they rely entirely on the labor market, entirely on wage income. And if something goes wrong in that labor market, we are going to see this economy slow much faster than anybody would like it to slow. Walmart as well, talking about a loss of pricing power. We've been talking about that over the last few months or so. Bob Michael, I'm pleased that Tom brought up the mid-90s. You've talked about the mid-2000s. You share those concerns about economic weakness, cracks starting to build, yet you are still bullish, as bullish as you have been since the mid-2000s. Could you explain why? Well, I, I think Mohammed's right. I, I think you have to watch how businesses are reacting in this environment, and there are some pressures. I think what we need to watch is the unemployment rate. Does that start to go above 4%? And certainly at 4.2%, it would get the Fed's attention, and they would do something as long as inflation is reasonable. And what they did in 95 is come in and cut rates three times. As I said, that's the one soft landing that I've lived through in my 40-plus years in the market. It looks like it's doable again, but it can't be a Fed that sits on the sidelines the entire year and leaves real yields where they are. I have to give you a victory lap, Bob, because you basically said that this is what they might do to kind of give a nod to a little bit more of a dovish stance while having a more hawkish stance in the, in the actual statement, which is maybe essentially what they're doing, which is the reason why the market might like this. I am wondering, though, to Mohammed's point about stagflation light or the winds of stagflation, that they're not going to address this. They're going to talk about strength in the economy so that they don't have to address that maybe they're looking at a 3% target of inflation rather than 2 Powell's probably laughing every time he hears stagflation because <laughs> he remembers, and he's probably thinking what I am. If Volcker would hear, here we go, 2.8% core PCE year over year. This. I would take that in a <laughs> second. And if you go back to 95 to 98, which Tom points out was great for markets, Inflation traded between two and a half to three yeah. percent. It, it was a pretty vibrant yeah. economy. I don't know what markets will do. I think that kind of economic scenario is realistic. I mean, I mean John, X, X 1998 was a moonshot. The Dow went from 4,000 oh, to 10,000. Yeah. Just, you know, I remember this. Somebody's really. looking to get out of triple <laughs> leverage. What's, what's, That's what's what I'm doing. I'm looking here. for the first you trade out of triple leverage I cash. This. Today's the days. <laughs> Today's the day. Bob's got some bonds to sell. <laughs> Diane Swank joins us now, chief economist at KPMG. Mohammed and Bob are going to be sticking with us. Diane, you've had 11. 12 minutes to go over this, going into the news conference with Chairman Powell, 18 minutes away. What's your big question for him after reading that statement? Well, one of the things that I'm surprised at that they could have gone more hawkish on, and I think the nod to inflation picking up more recently was the compromise, is that they left it 
They're waiting to decide when to reduce rates. And you've got to believe within that meeting, given that we've heard that it's a possibility that we could see rate hikes if inflation persists from Fed leadership themselves, that to keep that line, reduce rates, when they're going to reduce rates, that they still think the threshold to raise rates is much higher than the threshold to cut rates. I think that's where the bias is within the Fed. However, what I'll be looking for in the conference, the press conference is, was there debate, and in the minutes to this meeting, was there debate about the possibility that they might need to raise rates? Now, I think the move up in inflation we've seen is been you know, somewhat overstated. We know there's some residual seasonality somewhere between the fourth quarter and the first quarter's reality. That's still too hot. And there are, what we saw in inflation was much more broad-based <clears throat> inflation in the service sector. Things like home maintenance, car maintenance. It wasn't insurance as much mm -hmm. this month, but those are things that are the things that Muhammad talks about, less retractable and also more systemic. But there was service sector inflation in the employment cost index as well, not in the lowest wage jobs, particularly in food services and accommodation, where they've been decelerating quite rapidly and are now trailing overall inflation numbers. But in the overall services sector, where we do have some labor shortages still pretty acute, there is right. wage pressures there, and that's what the Fed's going to be focused on. And Diane, you know the Diane Swank charm is you're not living within three zip codes or some fancy university in the United uh, Kingdom. Diane, just simply put, if you drive seven hours south of Chicago, What's it like right now? Because I see with all the mail I get, what you get out on LinkedIn is there's a massive divide right now between the financial people and the rest of America. What's it like south of Illinois? Well, you know, what's really interesting is they've just done a study on this in terms of how different people view what the inflation problem is. Wealthy households, those in the urban areas, they tend to view the entire inflation problem as completely the fault of the Fed. Those who are less wealthy see this as price gouging. They see this as an inequality issue. And we still have gross inequalities, even though we had this massive leveling up of wages, even for low wage workers. As I've said before, they move from the shadows of the economy into the sun only to be burned by inflation. And that inequality and even the wealth picked up, we saw across income strata, that wasn't enough because inequality continued to worsen. And I think that's what you see when you're dealing with this kind of inflation, even though it's at a low grade. And I wouldn't compare it to 1995. 1995, the Fed was wrong in 1994. Chairman Greenspan had a checklist. I remember it well. And it filled it out, and he thought he could preempt inflation. And he was wrong, and he nearly derailed the economy. That was not coming off an inflationary kind of situation that we have today. It's just not comparable. This raises this question. And, uh, Mohammed, I'd love to get your answer, since you live within a couple zip codes of a fancy UK college that Tom was maligning. But I will say, I want to hear what you have to say about this idea of the messaging of Fed Chair Powell in the press conference. Do you think he needs to be hawkish, that he needs to keep the market under pressure in order to keep them on this goal of at least even having the cover to cut rates this year, as you think is necessary, as they want to do, but under the auspices of data dependency is difficult without some more cracking? I think the most important thing, Lisa, for him is to stick to what actually happened in the meetings and not end up like we have in the past where his messaging is different from the messaging from the minutes that we're going to get in a few weeks. Because if that happens, that is going to cause too much volatility yet again, confusion, and is, is going to erode forward policy guidance. If what he says is, it, in fact, what was said in the meeting and is confirmed by the minutes, then what he should do is stick to where he is right now, which is not validate the amount of the hawkish pivot, if you like, that the market has done, not go all the way, but go some of the way. You know, my concern is ultimately he may end up more hawkish than he needs to be for the well-being of the economy, but that's more for the next meeting than it is for this meeting. Diane, your view on that? Do you think that he's going to come out maybe more hawkish than he needs to be as well? 
I think he is. I think that is the risk, and it's because the risk has been on the other side. And Mohammed's exactly right. It's very hard. These press conferences, having them every single meeting, there is a downside to transparency. We see all the sausage being made, but you also see individual personality of the chairman himself and his own views and how that gets translated and gets muddled in terms of what the overall messaging is. And it's not that he's a bad communicator, but it is that this is really hard. I think one of the things that I get really frustrated with is how little uncertainty certainty the leadership of the Federal Reserve have really shown about the economy. I think Chair Powell has actually been more humble in that regard because he's had to eat crow in public on this issue. But the humility and uncertainty we face is very high. And that the sort of, you know, coming out and making statements following the meeting to counter or to change the message or reflect the message that was in the meeting, um, I think is not productive. But it's also the, con the certainty with which some of these comments are made is really not helpful either because there is a lot of uncertainty. Let's face it, we were at 2% on the Fed's you know, run rate for three and six months on core and overall inflation coming down. And people were arguing that they should be cutting like crazy. And the Fed, <laughs> at least in a prescient manner, said, let's be cautious here. We've been, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. They said, no, I'm not going to be head faked by this again. And they held back. That was good to hold back because, in fact, we have seen an acceleration. It's probably overstated, but we've got to see where we're going. And there is time with the lags that are already still in the market with regard to Fed tightening. Diane, this was great. Diane Swunk of KPMG. Diane, thank you. Talking about humility, you've got to remember four months ago, we had people on this program talking about cuts in March. This was a Fed that was meant to be already cutting, and now there's a conversation about him at least entertaining the potential of hiking interest rates. Mike Gape of Bank of America with us now. Michael Gape, and I keep hearing that Chairman Powell's going to be hawkish. Could you define for us what hawkish will sound like in this news conference, given you, like others, think that the first cut comes in December, which is not any time soon? Yeah, I think hawkish today simply, simply is a, a wait-and-see message. A, we, need we need to give policy more time to work. That's really about as, as far as I think they go today. I think he can repeat or will repeat their view that the supply side is helping bring inflation down. So inflation is still in a downward trend. Progress hasn't been where we wanted it to, to be, but we think our policy stance is tight. So the answer is let that tight policy work for longer. I think that's about as far as they're, they're ready to go today. That's, that's hawkish in May. We'll see what hawkish might look like in June. Uh, Bob Michael, are we back to normal? Are we beyond the pandemic? Are we talking about fixed income dynamics, Fabozzi 101, that makes sense now post-pandemic? Are we still living the debris of what we had for three, four years? No, we're still in the shadow of COVID. I strongly there, there's, agree. There's still yeah. Yeah. stimulus that's being distributed. When we talk to our municipal research team, they're talking about state and local governments accessing it, going out, doing some hiring and spending it. When you talk to businesses, they're talking about accessing some of the Infrastructure Act, some of the Chip, CHIPS Act. So that money is still there. When you look at consumer balance sheets, deposit balances on averages are still a little bit above where they were pre-COVID. So it's still sloshing around a little bit. But it's coming down pretty quickly. Which raises a question about long and variable lags and exactly how the Fed views that. Michael Gape, and I'm curious about your view about whether this is a Fed that has yet abandoned that or not, considering the fact that so many people are saying this is an economy that can live with higher rates. This has been the evidence of it is the strength in the market, the strength in debt markets in general. Do you think that they're going to go there or that it matters in terms of their faith in long and variable lags? I don't think they'll go there and say great detail today, but I agree with some of the comments that, that Bob made earlier um, about long and variable lags kind of still being in the pipeline. I think some parts of the economy reacted very quickly to higher rates. Others, it may still be in front of us. So things like fixed rate mortgages, the, the effective mortgage rate only rising very little, corporates needing to refinance at some point. There, I think you can make a case that some of the monetary policy tightening is still in the pipeline. It's just been elongated. I doubt that the chair is going to get into that today, although I think it's a very reasonable question to ask him, uh, you know, in light of inflation in recent months, is your policy stance as tight 
as you think it is. If not, what are you going to do about it? Are they sufficiently restrictive? Mike Gapen, just a final question from me, one to explore. I think we've spent the last month or so trying to work out how this Federal Reserve is going to respond every single day to upside surprises. Could you entertain this just a little bit? Just indulge me. How reactive will they be to downside surprises? I'm trying to understand. You get a downside surprise on Friday. How quickly will this conversation change? Will we be sitting here talking about cuts all over again? I mean, I think you'd probably need a number under 150 to, to get that discussion on the, on the table. If, if consensus is right in that 240 to 275 range, you have to majorly undershoot that. You need something that changes the overall narrative. And I, people like me would need to say, oh, looks like the catch-up effect in services employment is done, is over. So the labor market looks fundamentally different. It's a pretty big hurdle in my, in my view. Mike Gapen of Bank of America. Mike, thank you, sir. Great to catch up with you. Thank you. Mike Gapen and Bank of America, base case, December is going to be that first cut. Wow. Mohammed, I want to come to you on that. You've talked about how sensitive this Federal Reserve is from data point to data point. Do you think this has the potential, this conversation has the potential to change and change quite fast in the other direction? I do, John, because they're so reactive. I mean, the one thing we didn't talk about, and Tom talked about the 90s, is the economy is changing both domestically and internationally. The 90s was about deregulation, liberalization, and fiscal prudence. Today, it's about re-regulation, heavier government intervention, and fiscal irresponsibility. The 90s was about globalization. We, now, it's about fragmentation. This is a significantly different operating environment. So the, the risk is that you miss all these, those signals and you end up reacting too slowly to what's coming up. You know, I smiled when I, when I heard Bob say, well, it's, it's very easy. You know, if we get all these bad numbers, um, the Fed can simply react. But by the time it reacts, the harm has been made. It's a little bit like being on a, on a plane where the pilot is reacting to past turbulence. He's just going to add to the turbulence um, in the short term. So, so there is an issue about having to step back and ask the question, what economy are we operating in and where is the balance of risk for this economy? Which has been a big debate. Bob, what's your take on that? Do you agree with Mohammed that maybe they should move quickly if they start to see weakness? Unclear what they will do. It, it's already there, some of the weakness. When you look at consumer sentiment, consumers are frustrated. They're having to make choices on where their dollar goes. They're going down brand. The, when you look at the housing market, home affordability is a train wreck. And you look at existing home sales, they're low. So the consumer is feeling the pressure. You look at middle market corporate America, their cost of funding went from, call it 6% to somewhere around 10 to 12%. And that's what they're paying. And they're feeling the pressure of higher input costs. Mm -hmm. That's really strangling their margins. So a lot of it is there. A lot of it is slowing down. Maybe that's some of what we saw in first quarter GDP. I don't know, but we, we're going to see more of it. If you look at the unemployment number, for me, if that starts to go above 4%, that's really going to get the Fed's attention. Dr. O'Leary, I've got to be real quick here, but I think it's timely with college protests across America. I'm not sure what's going on at Cambridge. But I want to be very clear here, Mohammed, on Joe Stiglitz's book, The Road to Freedom, Economics and the Good Society. Is Chairman Powell today going to speak to a fractured America, to the polarities of America, or is this basically to the financial audience? I think he's going to, he's going to speak to everybody in the beginning when he says that the Fed is committed to the well-being of Americans, all Americans, etc. But he's going to stay a mile away from what's going on on college campuses. Yeah, he might not say a mile away, though, of the fact that they are not necessarily going to be focused on the election. And Bob, do you have the sense that if they do not cut rates in July, they only can go in December because of the potential election questions and political interference? No, I, I've had enough conversations with former Fed officials that if they need to go in September, they will go in September. What does need to go look like? Exactly. Yeah. I, I, for, for us, it is rising unemployment. Yeah. It's something about 4.2%. That's the threshold. That's it. Break into the fours. Mohammed, would, would you agree with that? I would. I think Bob is right. Get into the fours. They start to cut. What, 25 basis points or they start to freak out? 
Well, it, it depends what else is going on because Mohammed is right. Once this starts, it tends to escalate very quickly. So if you're going to make that first cut after waiting so long, why not do 50? Mohammed, I'm just curious what your question would be to Fed Chair Jay Powell at a time when a lot of people are just saying simply, what would it take for you to hike rates? What would your question be? The one thing we haven't talked about at all is what is the terminal rate? Where does he think we end up? You know, we talk about the journey, but will, will someone tell us where the destination is? Will you tell us what you think the destination is, Mohammed? I think it's significantly higher than what the Fed is saying right now. They're at what, Mohammed? Two and something? Two and a half? Oh, no, I think we are above three in you, terms of, yeah. You think we're closer to four? Yes, we, I, yes, that's what I think we are. Bob, how do you do quickly here? Bob, how do you dovetail with that with Feroli's potential GDP under 2%? How do we have a run rate above 3% as Dr. Larian talks about and JP Morgan's publishing out an economy that's uh, a little bit beneath that to be kind? Um, everything goes in stages and a high real Fed funds rate is going to slow things down. The Fed will pull back the Fed funds rate um, I agree with Mohammed. Maybe something like in that three and a half to four percent bracket. I think two point six percent is a fantasy. That will create enough stimulus that things will pick up again. So it, it's going to come in cycles again, as it always does. Begs the question: If it is a fantasy, why aren't they adjusting that? Do you think that's just something they don't want to engage with at the moment? Have a debate about where that long dot should be. Is that what that's about? Well, my question that Mike McKee should be asking is have the dots outlived their usefulness? I believe they have. I think they should do away with it. I think in 2012, when they were in completely uncharted territory, they helped for a very brief period of time. Bob Michael of JP Morgan to the brilliant Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College Cambridge to the both of you. Thank you very much for being with us. Going into this Fed news conference with Chairman Powell, the scores look like this. Let's begin with the S&P 500. In the last couple of moments, turning positive, we're higher by 0.1 to 0.2 percent. The Nasdaq just about unchanged. I want to sit on the bond market just for a moment with you, Lita, and talk about what's happening with the two-year. The repricing here. First meeting of the year, what were we? Something like 420? Yeah. Next meeting, 460. This meeting, 5%. We've added 40 basis points in between meetings each and every time. For good reason. And it's not because of Fed rhetoric. It's because of the economic data that's come in hotter than expected. The strength that you talk about, very much persistent under the hood, albeit perhaps with some of the cracks that you're talking about. Key question is, are they comfortable with this? Are they happy with this? What do they see over the longer term? How do they see the federal deficit sort of weighing in on all of this? Honestly, there are a lot of questions. Is he going to just try to be as boring as possible? Let's see. What did Claudia Sam say? Don't speak. <laughs> yeah, anytime he opens up <laughs> That'd his be mouth. an interesting news conference. Yeah, it's going to be downside risk from here. Take a listen. Don't speak. In just a moment, <laughs> Chair pa Chairman Powell is going to walk through that door and hopefully <laughs> he stands at that podium and does actually say something. Lisa, that last line of this statement, there has been a lack of further progress towards the committee's 2% inflation objective. Mohammed said he needs to complete the sentence. What does that sound like? Basically, at this point, how much is that a structural change? Why is this the case? Are, is he going to come out and say, essentially, it just is going to take a lot longer. Those long and variable lags are just a whole lot longer. Here's the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the news conference with Chairman Powell. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to pro promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. The economy has made considerable progress toward our dual mandate objectives. Inflation has eased substantially over the past year, while the labor market has remained strong. And that's very good news. But inflation is still too high. Further progress in bringing it down is not assured, and the path forward is uncertain. We are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustainably strong labor market that benefits all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings, though at a slower pace. <clears throat> our restrictive stance of monetary policy has been putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation, and the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals have moved toward better balance over the past year. 
However, in recent months, inflation has shown a lack of further progress toward our 2% objective, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a solid pace. Although GDP growth moderated from 3.4% in the fourth quarter of last year to 1.6% in the first quarter, private domestic final purchases, which excludes inventory investment, government spending, and net exports, and usually sends a clearer signal on underlying demand, was 3.1% in the first quarter, as strong as the second half of 2023. <clears throat> Consumer spending has been robust over the past several quarters, even as high interest rates have weighed on housing and equipment investment. Improving supply conditions have supported resilient demand and the strong performance of the U.S. economy over the past year. The labor market remains relatively tight, but supply and demand conditions have come into better balance. Payroll job gains averaged 276,000 jobs per month in the first quarter, while the unemployment rate remains low at 3.8%. Strong job creation over the past year has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, reflecting increases in participation among individuals aged 25 to 54 years and a continued strong pace of immigration. Nominal wage growth <clears throat> has eased over the past year and the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, but labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation has eased notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2%. Total PCE prices rose 2.7% over the 12 months ending in March. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8%. The inflation data received so far this year have been higher than expected. Although some measures of short-term inflation expectations have increased in recent months, Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at 5.25 to 5.5%, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings, though at a slower pace. Over the past year, as labor market tightness has eased, and inflation has declined, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals have moved toward better balance. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We've stated that we do not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range for the federal funds rate until we have gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. So far this year, the data have not given us that greater confidence. In particular, and as I noted earlier, readings on inflation have come in above expectations. It is likely that gaining such greater confidence will take longer than previously expected. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for as long as appropriate. We're also prepared to respond to an unexpected weakening in the labor market. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. Policy is well positioned to deal with the risks and uncertainties that we face in pursuing both sides of our dual mandate. We will continue to make decisions meeting by meeting. Turning to our balance sheet, the committee decided at today's meeting to slow the pace of decline in our securities holdings, consistent with the plans we released previously. <clears throat> Specifically, the cap on Treasury redemptions will be lowered from the current $60 billion per month 
to $25 billion per month as of June 1. Consistent with the committee's intention to hold primarily Treasury securities in the longer run, we're leaving the cap on agency securities unchanged per month, <clears throat> and we will re reinvest any proceeds in excess of this cap in Treasury securities. With principal payments on agency securities currently running at about $15 billion per month, total portfolio runoff will amount to roughly $40 billion per month. The decision to slow the pace of runoff does not mean that our balance sheet will ultimately shrink by less than it would otherwise, but rather allows us to approach its ultimate level more gradually. In particular, slowing the pace of runoff will help ensure a smooth transition, reducing the possibility that money markets experience stress and thereby facilitating the ongoing decline in our securities holdings that are consistent with reaching the appropriate level of ample reserves. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Um, a question to follow up, if I could. Uh, do you consider the current policy rate uh, still, uh, are you confident that it's sufficiently restrictive to get inflation back to 2 percent? So I, I, do, I do think the evidence shows, you know, pretty clearly that policy is restrictive and is weighing on demand. And um, there are a few places I would point to for that. You can start with the labor market. Um, so demand is still strong, uh, the demand side of the labor market in particular. But it's cooled from its extremely high level of a couple of years ago. And you see that in, in job openings. You saw it, uh, more evidence of that today in the JOLTS report, as you'll know. Uh, it's still higher than pre-pandemic, but it has been coming down both in the Indeed report and in the JOLTS report. That's, that's demand cooling. Uh, the same is true of quits and hiring rates, which have essentially normalized. Um, <clears throat> I also look at the, we look at <clears throat> surveys of workers and, <clears throat> pardon me, surveys of workers and businesses and ask workers, are jobs plentiful? And ask businesses, are workers plentiful? Is it easy to find workers? And you've seen that the answers to those have come back down to pre-pandemic pre levels. You also see in, in intersensitive spending like housing and investment, you also see that higher interest rates are weighing on those <clears throat> activities. So I do think it's clear that, um, that policy is restrictive. Sufficiently restrictive, I guess. Is so <clears throat> I, I would say that we, we believe it is restrictive, and, and we believe over time it will be sufficiently restrictive. That will be a question that, <clears throat> that the data will have to answer. So as a follow-up, if inflation <clears throat> me. continues running roughly sideways, as it has been, uh, the job market stays reasonably strong, <clears throat> unemployment low, and expectations are anchored and maintained, would you disrupt that for- Expectations are not anchored? Or, or anchored. Or are anchored. Stable, roughly. Would you disrupt that for the last half point on PCE? You know, I don't want to get into complicated hypotheticals, but <clears throat> I would say that, you know, we're committed to retain, retaining our current uh, restrictive stance of policy for as long as is appropriate, and we'll do that. Gina. Thanks for taking our questions, Chair Powell. Um, I wonder, you know, obviously Michelle Bowman has been saying that there is a risk that rates may need to increase further, although it's not her baseline outlook. I wonder if you see that as a risk as well, and if so, <clears throat> what change in conditions would merit considering raising rates at this point? So I, I think it's unlikely uh, that the next policy rate move will be a hike. I'd say it's unlikely. Um, you know, our policy focus is really what I just mentioned, which is, which is uh, how long to keep policy restrictive. You ask, what would it take? <clears throat> you know, I think we'd need to see persuasive evidence that our policy stance is not sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to 2% over time. That's not, that's not what we think we're seeing, as I, as I mentioned. But that's, that's something like that is what it would take. If we'd look at the totality of the data answer to that question. That would include inflation, inflation expectations, and all the other data, too. Would 
Well, I think, again, the, the, the test, I, I, what I'm saying is if we were to come to that conclusion that policy weren't tight enough to achieve that, so it would be the totality of, of all the things we'd be looking at. It, it could be expectations. It could be a combination of things. But if we, if we reach that conclusion and we, we don't see evidence supporting that conclusion, that's what it would take, I think, for us to, to take that step. Chris. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Uh, you didn't mention the idea that rates are at a peak uh, for the cycle and didn't mention the idea that it might be appropriate to cut rates later this year. Uh, as you have at previous press conferences. So has the Fed sort of dropped its easing bias? Where are you standing on that? So one, um, uh, let, let me address uh, cuts. So obviously our decisions that we make on our policy rate are going to depend on the incoming data, how the outlook is evolving, and the balance of risks, as always. <clears throat> and we'll look at the totality of the data. So I think and we think that policy is well positioned to address different paths that the economy might take. Um, and we've said that we don't think it would be appropriate to dial back our restrictive policy stance until we've gained greater confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward 2 percent. So, for example, let me take a path. Uh, if we did have a path where inflation proves more persistent than expected and where the labor market remains strong, strong but inflation is moving sideways and we're not gaining greater confidence, well, that would be a case in which it could be appropriate to hold off on rate cuts. I think there's also other paths that the economy could take which, which would cause us to want to consider rate cuts, and those would be two, two of those paths would be that we do gain greater confidence, as we've said, if that inflation is moving sustainably down to 2 percent, and another path could be you know, a, an unexpected weakening in the labor market, for example. So those are paths in which, in, in which you could see us uh, uh, cutting rates. So I think there, it really will depend on the data. In terms, of, in terms of peak rate, you know, I, I think um, really it's the same question. I, I, uh, I, I think the data will, will have to answer that question for us. Well, and could you just follow uh, on the path where you might not cut? Is that you mentioned that it would be inflation persistent? Uh, I mean, is inflation, would that be the key data in making that decision? Or could you expand a bit more on that? Thank well, you. Again, it's... Uh, it's um, We've set us ourselves a test that we, for us to begin to reduce policy restriction, we'd want to be confident that inflation is moving, you know, moving uh, sustainably down to two percent. And for sure, one of the things we'd be looking at is the performance of inflation. We'd also be looking at inflation expectations. We'd be looking at the whole story. But clearly, incoming, uh, incoming inflation data would be at the very heart of that of that uh, decision. Nick Tamaros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, to what extent has the easing in financial conditions since November contributed to the reacceleration in growth? And do you now expect a period of sustained tighter financial conditions will be needed to resume the sort of disinflation the economy saw last year? So I, I think it's hard to know that. I think we'll, we'll be able to look back, you know, from down the road and look back and, and understand it better. You know, if you, if you look at, um, let's look at growth, really uh, what we've seen so far this year in the first quarter is growth coming in about consistent with, with where it was last year. I know GDP came in lower, but you don't see an acceleration in growth. I mean, the thought would be that financial conditions loosen in, in, in December, and that caused an uptick in activity, and that caused inflation. Presumably that's what we're tightening in the labor market. You, you don't really see that happening. What you see is economic activity at a level that's roughly the same as, as last year. So, you know, what, what's causing this inflation, you know, we'll, we'll have a better sense of that over time. I don't know that there's an obvious connection there, though, with the easing of financial conditions. In terms of tightening, you're, you're right. I mean, rates are certainly higher now and have been for some time than they were before the December meeting, and, and uh, they're higher, and that's tighter financial conditions. And, you know, that's appropriate given, uh, given what inflation has done in the first quarter. You've said in the past that stronger growth wouldn't necessarily preclude rate cuts. I wonder, would continued strength in the labor market change your view about the appropriate stance of policy if it was accompanied by signs that wage growth was reaccelerating? So I just want to be careful that we don't target wage growth or the labor market. And remember what we saw last year, very strong growth, a really tight labor market, and a historically fast decline in inflation. 
So we, and, and that's because we know there are, there are two forces at work here. There's the unwinding of the pandemic-related supply-side distortions and, and, and demand-side distortions, and there's also monetary policy, you know, uh, restrictive monetary policy. So I, I wouldn't rule out that something like that can, can continue. You know, I wouldn't give up or, at this point on further things happening on the supply side, either because, you know, we do see that, uh, that companies still report that, that, that there are supply side issues that they're facing. And also, even when the supply side issue, issues are solved, it should take some time for that to affect economic activity and ultimately inflation. So there are still those things. So I, d I don't like to say that either strong, uh, gr either growth or, or a strong labor market in and of itself would automatically uh, create problems on inflation because, of course, it didn't do that last year. You ask about wages. We, we, we also don't, we don't target wages. We, we target, target price inflation. It is one of the inputs. The point with wages is, of course, we, we like everyone else, like to see high wages, but we, we also want to see them not eaten up by, uh, by high inflation. And that's really what we're, what we're trying to do is to, is to cool the economy and, and work with what's happening on the supply side to bring, uh, to bring the economy back to 2% inflation. And part of that will probably be uh, having wage increases move down incrementally toward levels that are more sustainable. Rachel. <clears throat> Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You talked about needing time to gain more confidence that inflation is sustainably moving back down to 2%. It's May now. Do you have time this year to cut three times, just given the calendar? Yeah, I'm not really thinking of it that way. Um, I, I, you know, the, what, I, what we said is that we, we need to be more confident, and we've said, my colleagues and I today said, that uh, uh, we didn't see progress in the first, uh, uh, in the first quarter. And I've said that it, it, it appears then that uh, it's going to take longer for us to, to reach that point of conference. So I don't know how long it'll take. I, I, you know, I can just say uh, that when we get that confidence, then, then rate cuts will be, will be in scope. And, and I don't know exactly when that will be. And with hindsight, are there any signs that you can look back on now, looking at the reports from January or February or March, that suggested something more worrying than just expected bumpiness? I, you know, not really. You know, what, what um, so I, I thought it was appropriate to reserve judgment until, until we had the full quarter's data, until we saw the March data. And let, so take a step back. What do we now see in the first quarter? We see strong uh, economic activity. We see a strong labor market. And we see inflation. We see three inflation readings. <clears throat> and, and you, so I think you're at a point there where you, where you should take some signal. I, 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 we don't like to react to one or two months' data, but this is a full quarter. And I think it's appropriate to take signal now, and we are taking signal. And the signal that we're taking is that it's likely to take longer for us to gain confidence that we are on a sustainable path down to 2 percent inflation. That's the signal that we're taking, uh, you know. Steve. And Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, Steve Leisman, CNBC, if I could follow up on that. Um, what particular areas were sort of temporary or blips in the inflation data in the first quarter? And, What's the dynamic by which you expect them to work out in the coming uh, months and quarters? Yeah. So we, we will, um, you know, we will put the thing, we have put the thing under a microscope. I will say nothing is going to come out of that that's going to change the view, I think, that in fact uh, we didn't gain confidence and that it's going to take longer to get that confidence. But confidence, I, I just think, you, I mean, you know the story. What, what, um, what's happened since December is you've seen uh, higher goods inflation than expected, and you've seen higher uh, non-housing services inflation than expected, and those two are working together to, to sort of be higher than, than we had thought. And there are stories behind how that happened, uh, and, you know, we, I, think, I think my expectation is that we will, over the course of this year, see inflation move back down. That, that's my, my forecast. I, I think my confidence in that is lower than it was uh, because of the data that we've seen. So, we're, you know, we're looking at those things. We also continue to expect, and I continue to expect, that housing services inflation, given where market rents are, those will show up in, in, uh, in measured housing services inflation over time. Uh, we believe that it, it will. It just it, it looks like the lat that there are substantial lags between 
when uh, you know lower market rates turned up and and uh, for new tenants, and and when it shows up for existing tenants or or for in housing services. So, <clears throat> if I could just follow up, is there a bit of a contradiction in the idea that you are reducing quantitative tightening, which is sort of an easing, while you're holding rates steady at a restrictive rate to try to slow and cool the economy and inflation? Thank you. No, I, I wouldn't say that. No, I mean the, the active tool of monetary policy is, of course, interest rates, and uh, this is this is a, <clears throat> a long a plan we've long had in place to to slow, uh, really not not in order to um, uh, you know to provide accommodation to the economy, but to, or to, to, to be less restrictive to the economy, it really is to ensure that the process of shrinking the balance sheet down to where we want to get it is a smooth one and doesn't wind up uh, in, uh, with, with financial market turmoil the way it did the last, uh, the last time we did this and the only other time we've ever done this. Craig. Morris from Bloomberg. Uh, two questions. First, simple one. Um, given the run of data since March, has the probability in your mind of no cuts this year increased or stayed the same? That's the first question. Second question. Chair Powell, you joined the board in 2012, and I'm sure you remember, as I do, what the jobless recovery was like. Um, lawyers, accountants, all kinds of highly qualified people who couldn't get jobs. And given your history there, I wonder if there's an argument for being more patient with inflation here. Um, we have strong productivity growth. That's helping wages grow up, go up. We have good employment. And so it seems to me there's a lot of hysteria about inflation. I, I agree. It's, you know, nobody likes it. But, but is there an argument for being patient and working with the economic cycle to get it down over time? Thank you. So on your first question, I don't have a probability estimate for you, but all I can say is <clears throat> that, uh, you know, we've said we, that we didn't think it would be appropriate to cut until we were more confident uh, that inflation was moving sustainably on 2 percent. We didn't get our confidence in that didn't increase in the first quarter. And in fact, what really happened was uh, uh, we came to the view that it will take longer to get that confidence. And I think there are, it, uh, you know, I think it's uh, the economy has been very hard for forecasters broadly to predict <clears throat> to predict its path. But there are paths to to not cutting, and there are paths to cutting. It's really going to depend on the data. In terms of the in, the um, employment mandate, to your point, um, if you go back a couple of years, uh, our 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 sort of framework document says that when uh, you look at the two mandate goals, and if one of them's further away from from goal than the other, then you focus on that one. It actually, it's it's the time to get back there times the uh, you know times how far it is from the goal, and that was clearly inflation. So our focus was very much on inflation, as as and this is what we referred to in the in the statement. As um, we as inflation has come down now to uh, below three percent on a on a on a uh, twelve month basis. Um, it's become, it, it, we be, we're now focusing, the, the other goal, the, the employment goal, now comes back in for, to focus. And so we are focusing on it. Um, and and that's, that's how we think about that. Claire. Claire Jones, fin Financial Times. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to ask the questions. Just to go back to the answer before um, the previous one. Um, it seemed to suggest that you think the likeliest path of inflation is one that's going to allow you to have a situation where rates are lower at the end of the year than they are right now. It would be good if you could just confirm whether or not that's a correct reading. Um, and the Q1 GDP print has um, led to some, some to start mentioning the term stagflation with respect to the U.S. economy. Do you or anyone else on the FOMC think this is now a risk. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not um, dealing really in likelihoods. I think there are there are paths that the economy can take that would that would involve cuts in their paths that wouldn't. And I, I don't have great confidence in which of those paths. I think my I would say my personal forecast is that we will begin to see further progress on inflation this year. I don't know that it will be enough sufficient. I don't know that it won't. I think we're, we're going to have to let the data uh, lead us on that. 
In terms of your question, your second question was stagflation. <clears throat> I, um, I guess I would say I, re I was around for stagflation, and it was, um, you know, 10% uh, unemployment. It was high single digits inflation. Right now we have, and, 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 and uh, very slow growth. So um, right now we have 3% growth, which is, you know, pretty solid growth, I would say, by any measure. And we have inflation running under 3%. So uh, I, don't, I don't really understand where that's coming from. And, and uh, uh, in addition, I would say, you know, most forecasters, including our, our forecasting, was that, uh, that last year's level of growth was very high, 3.4% in, I guess, the fourth quarter, you know, and probably not going to be sustained and would come down, but that would, be, that would be our forecast. That wouldn't be stagflation. That would still be to a very healthy level of growth. And of course, with inflation, you know, our, we will return inflation to, to 2%, and that won't be, so I don't see the stag or the inflation, actually. <clears throat> Michael McKee from Bloomberg uh, Radio and Television. Uh, the vice chair of the FOMC said recently that he's willing to consider the idea that potential growth has moved up. And of course, he's Mr. Potential Growth, our star. Do you share that view? And would that imply that maybe policy isn't tight enough? I sir, so I think I would take that question this way. Um, we saw a year of very high productivity growth in 2023. And we saw a year of, I think, negative productivity growth in 2022. So I think it's hard to draw from the data. Uh, I mean, the question is, will productivity run? There are two questions. One is, will productivity run you know, persistently above its longer run trend? I don't think we know that. In terms of potential output, though, if that's a separate question. We, we've had a what amounts to a uh, uh, a significant increase in the potential output of the economy that's not about productivity. It was about having more labor, frankly, both through in, in 2023, both through participation and also through immigration. So we're very much like other forecasters and economists getting our arms around what that means for potential output this year and next year and, and last year for that matter, too. So I think in that case, I think you really do have a significant increase in potential output, but you've also got so you've got more supply, but those people also come in, they, they, are, they work, they have jobs, they spend. So you've also got demand. So it, it, may, there may be, it may be that you get more supply than you get demand at the beginning, but ultimately it should be neither inflationary nor disinflationary over a, over a longer period. Well, you uh, said earlier <clears throat> that um, at this point you're not really considering rate increases. If uh, growth is higher but you're not considering rate increases, does that imply that you're more worried about causing the economy to slow too much than you are about inflation taking off again? No, I, I think we, we, we believe our, our policy stance is in a good place and, and is appropriate to the current situation. Uh, we believe it's restrictive. And, you know, we, our evidence for that I went over earlier. You, you see it in the labor market. You see it in inflation-sensitive spending, where demand has clearly come down a lot over the past few years. And that's that's more from monetary policy, whereas the supply side things that are happening are more on the supply side. So um, that, that's how I would think about it. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Edward Lawrence uh, from Fox Business. So GDP growth is about 2 percent. Inflation uh, employment is about 4 percent. It feels a lot like a steady state and we have 3 percent inflation. So if the data remains the same that you're seeing um, and I know you said you don't see a rate hike. But it stands to reason that you would need a rate hike to get from 3 to 2 percent inflation. So was there any discussion about a rate hike in today's meeting? Uh, and, you know, are you satisfied with 3 percent inflation for the rest of the year? Well, I, uh, of course, we're not satisfied with 3 percent inflation. Um, 3 percent can't be in a sentence with satisfied. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we will return inflation to 2 percent over time, but, but over time. And we think our policy stance is, is appropriate to do that. So if we were to conclude that policy is not sufficiently restrictive to bring uh, inflation sustainably down to 2%, then that's, that would be what it would take for us to want to increase rates. We don't see that. We don't see evidence for that. Uh, so that's where we are. With the discussion, was there a discussion about a rate hike at all? 
So the, the, the policy focus has been on, has really been on what to do about, about um, uh, holding the current, uh, the current level of restriction. That, that's really, that's part of the policy. That's where the policy discussion was in the meeting. I wanted to follow on the 3%. <clears throat> is there a time frame of persistent inflation that would trigger a rate hike? There, is, there isn't any rule. You can't look to a rule. You know, these are, these are going to be judgment calls. Uh, I, you know, clearly restrictive monetary policy needs more time to do its job. That, that, that is pretty clear based on what we're, what we're seeing. How long that will take and how patient we should be, it's going to depend on the totality of the data, how the outlook evolves. Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, you've talked about your commitment to being apolitical and nonpartisan, and I was just wondering, given that it's an election year, is the bar for rate changes higher uh, close to an election? And uh, similarly, is there a significant economic difference between, you know, starting to cut in, say, September versus December? So we're, we're always going to do what we think the right thing for the economy is when we come to that consensus view that it's the right thing to do for the economy. That's our record. That's what we do. We're not looking at anything else. You know, it's, it's hard enough to get the economics right here. These are difficult things. And if, we're, if, if we were to take on a whole other set of factors and, and use that as a new filter, it would reduce the likelihood we'd actually get the economics right. So that's how we think about it around here. And, you know, we're at peace over it. We, we know that we'll do what we think is the right thing when we think it's the right thing. And we'll all do that. And that, that's, that's how everybody around here thinks. So I, I, I can't say it enough that we just, don't, we just don't go down that road. If you go down that road, where do you stop? And, and we're, so we're not on that road. We're on the road where we're serving all the American people and making our decisions based on the data and how those data affect the outlook and the balance of risks. And then is there a significant difference between uh, you know, whether you start in, say, September versus December? And there's a, there's a significant difference between an institution that takes into account all sorts of political events and one that doesn't. That's where the significant difference is. And, and you know, we're, we just don't do that. I mean, you can, you can go back and read the transcripts for every, this is my fourth election, fourth presidential election here. Read all the transcripts and see if anybody mentions in, in any way the, the pending election. It just isn't part of our thinking. It's not what we're hired to do. If we start down that road, I, again, I don't know. I don't know how you stop. So, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Question about the labor market: You've mentioned a few times that the labor market is normalizing. Certainly, today's jolts data suggested that things are kind of getting back to pre-pandemic levels. One thing that hasn't normalized is wage growth, which is still quite a bit stronger than before the pandemic. I wonder if you can share your analysis of, of why that's happening. Is it a, a lagging indicator or is something else going on? So I think if you, if you go back to where wages peaked, wage increases peaked a couple, three years ago, essentially all wage measures have come down substantially to that. But they are not, not down to where they were before the pandemic. They're still roughly a percentage point higher. And we've seen pretty consistent progress, but not uniformly. And you'll note the, the ECI reading from Tuesday was it was expected to be to have come down. And essentially, it was flat year over year, to, uh, you know, I think, roughly. So yeah, I mean, it's that part of it is bumpy. And uh, again, we don't target wage increases. But but, it, you know, in, in the longer run, if you have infl if you have um, wage increases running, higher than productivity would warrant, and uh, then, you know, there, it, there will be inflationary pressures. Uh, employers will raise prices over time if that's the case. So we, we've seen progress. It, it has been, in, you know, inconsistent, but we have seen a substantial decline overall. But we have ways to go on that. Consumers and consumers are feeling the weight of interest rates right now. Mortgage rates are up, as are rates for car loans, credit cards. People looking to borrow are very discouraged. That's reflected in their views on the economy. What would you say to them? Well, um, the thing that hurts everybody, and particularly 
um, people in the lower income brackets is inflation. If you're a person who's living paycheck to paycheck and suddenly all the things you buy, the, the fundamentals of life go up in price, you, you are in trouble right away. And so with those people in mind in particular, what we're doing is we're using our tools to bring down inflation. It will take some time, but we will succeed, and we will bring inflation back down to 2%, and then people won't have to worry about it again. That's what we're doing, and we know that it's painful and inconvenient, but <clears throat> the, the dividends will be paid in the, in the will be very large, and, and everyone will share in those dividends. And we've made quite a lot of progress, if you, if you can think about it. Uh, I think, core, I think uh, headline core PCE peaked at, at 5.8, now it's at... Anyway, headline peaked at 7.1, now it's at 2.7. Don't want to get that wrong. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, quick follow-up. Are current interest rates really doing that much, <clears throat> though, to fight inflation right now for those consumers? Yes. I mean, I, th I, think, I think that restrictive monetary policy is doing what it's supposed to do, and it's, but it's also, in this case, unusually, working alongside and with the healing of the supply side. This, this that was different this time was that a big part of the of the source of the inflation and the reason why we're having this conversation is that we had this supply side kind of collapse with with shortages and and bottlenecks and all that kind of thing, and and so and, and this was to do with the shutting down and reopening of the economy and other things that that um, that really raised demand. So many factors did that. So I think now you see those two things working together, the, the reversal of those supply and demand distortions from, from the pandemic and the response to it, along with, with uh, restrictive monetary policy, those two things are working to bring down inflation, and we've made a lot of progress. Let's remember how far we've come. We, and we have a ways to go. We've got work left to do, but we're not looking at the very high inflation rates that we were seeing two years ago. Uh, Courtney Brown from Axios. Uh, thanks for taking our questions, Chair Powell. Um, I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned earlier on um, housing inflation. There's kind of been this long-awaited disinflation and shelter that still hasn't arrived. So I guess two questions. How do you explain the substantial lags between some of the private sector data we're seeing and um, the government data? And how confident are you that rents will be helpful on the inflation front in the coming months? So <clears throat> essentially, the, there, are, there are a number of places in the economy where, there's a, where there are just lag structures built into the inflation process, and housing is one of them. So when you have, um, when, you, when, when someone um, goes to, a new person goes to rent an apartment, that's called market rent. And you can see market rents are barely going up at all. They, the inflation in those has been very low. Um, but it takes – before that, they were incredibly high. They sort of led the, 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 the high part. So what happens is the, those market rents take years, actually, to get all the way into um, rents for uh, tenants who are rolling over their leases. Landlords don't tend to charge as much of an increase to a rollover tenant for whatever reason. And what that does is it builds up – a sort of an unrealized portion of increases when there have been big increases. And what happens is, you know, it's, it's complicated, but the story is it just takes some time for that to get in. Now, I'm, I am confident that as long as market rents remain low, this is going to show up in measured inflation, assuming that, that market rents do remain low. How, what will be the exact timing of it? I think, it, I think we've learned that the lags are longer. We now think significantly longer than we thought at the beginning. Um, and so confident that it will come, but not so confident in the timing of it. But yes, I expect that, uh, that this will happen. Thanks. <clears throat> Nick Thank you, Chair Powell, for taking the questions. This is Nicholas Jasinski from Barron's Magazine. Um, it seems that over the past three or four years, economies and central banks in developed markets at least have been on more or less the same trajectory, easing during the pandemic, fighting inflation with restrictive policy on the way out. Um, feels like that may be ending in 2024 based on some of the economic data from Europe and the U.S. and Japan and statements from those central banks as well. So my question is, what, what considerations or risks does a period of more divergent global economic trajectories and central bank policies present for the FOMC? So um, that, you're right. I think that, that may happen. And I, you, know, you know that we all serve domestic mandates, right? 
So I think the difference between the United States and, and other countries that are now considering uh, rate cuts is that they're just not having the kind of growth we're having. Uh, they, they have Their inflation is performing about like ours or maybe a little better, but they, they're not experiencing the kind of growth we're experiencing. So we actually have the luxury of having strong growth and a strong labor market, very low unemployment, high job creation, and all of that. And we can be patient, and we, and we will we'll be careful and cautious as we approach the decision to cut rates, whereas I think other, other jurisdictions may go before that. In terms of the implications, I, you know, I think um, the obviously markets see it coming. It's priced in now. And so I, th I think the economy, markets and economies can adapt to it. Uh, and I think, you know, we haven't seen, in addition for the emerging market economies, we haven't seen the kind of turmoil that was more frequent 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And that's, I think, partly because emerging market countries, many of them have much better monetary policy frameworks, much more credibility on inflation. And so they're navigating this pretty well this time. Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. You sort of backed away from the notion that the economy would need to encounter pain for inflation to come back down. But given sticky inflation data in the first quarter, can disinflation still happen along a relatively painless path for the economy? Or is some softening in the labor market and the economy likely needed to bring inflation back down? So you're right. We I think we thought in... in uh, most people thought there would have to be uh, probably a significant um, dislocations somewhere in the economy, perhaps the labor market, to get inflation all the way down from the very high levels it was at at the beginning of this episode. That didn't happen. That's a tremendous result. We're very, of course, gratified and pleased that that hasn't happened. And if you look at the dynamics that enabled that, it really was that this and the that that so much of the gain was from the unwinding of the, of things that weren't to do with monetary policy, but the unwinding of the distortions to the economy, you know, supply problems, supply side problems, and also some, some demand issues as well. The unwinding of those really helped inflation come down. <clears throat> now, as I've said, I, I'm not giving up on that. So I think, I think it is possible that, that, that those forces will still work to help us bring inflation down. We can't, we can't be guaranteed that that's true, though. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to use our tools in a way that keeps the, the labor market strong and the, and the economy strong, but also helps bring inflation back down to 2 percent sustainably. We will bring inflation down to 2 percent sustainably. We hope we can do it without, um, you know, without uh, uh, significant dislocations in the labor market or elsewhere. And speaking of dislocations in the labor market, um, in terms of cutting, you said if there were weakness in the job market, that could be a reason to cut rates. So if the unemployment rate were to tick above 4 percent, but inflation not back down to your 2 percent target, how would you look at that? Would the unemployment rate popping back above 4 percent catch your attention? You know, I, I said un an unexpected weakening is what I, what I, the way I characterize it. So, you know, I, I, and I'm not going to try to define exactly what I mean by that, but you know, it would be it had to be meaningful and, and get our attention and, and lead us to think that the labor market was really significantly weakening for us to want to react to it. Uh, you know, a couple of tenths in the unemployment rate would be would would probably not do that, but a broader it would be a broader thing that would that would suggest that uh, that it would be appropriate to consider uh, cutting. And I, I think whether you decide to cut will depend on all the facts and circumstances, not just that one. Chair Powell, thanks for taking the question. Kyle Campbell with American Banker. Uh, you've said that broad and material changes are needed for the Basel III endgame proposal, and you've mentioned that a reproposal is something that's on the table. As you've had more time to sort of sit with the public commentary, process that, and understand the options available to you, do you have a better sense of whether a reproposal will be necessary? Um, and do you have a timeline in mind for when um, you know, some sort of movement will be made on that front, either a reproposal or a, a move to finalize? So let me, let me start by saying that <clears throat> the Fed is committed to, you know, completing this process uh, and, and carrying out Basel III endgame in a way that's faithful to Basel and also comparable to what the other, other large comparable jurisdictions are doing. Um, we haven't made any decisions on, on uh, policy or on, on process at all. Nothing, nothing, no decisions have been made. I'll say again, though, 
if we conclude that that reproposal is appropriate, we won't hesitate to insist on that. And then do you need to <clears throat> resolve issues with the capital proposal in order to advance other parts of the regulatory agenda, or do you expect to continue to make progress on those other uh, agenda items? You know, there's no mechanical rule in place there, but I would say that the, you know, the Basel III it, uh, process is by far the most important thing and really is, I think, occupying us at this, at this time in terms of what's, what's, what we're moving ahead with. Thank you, Mark Hamrick with uh, Bankrate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what can you tell us about your, the approach that you take uh, with your role in the sense of trying to achieve consensus, which you recently identified as a priority, uh, while allowing for a range of views or even dissent? Uh, we don't see many dissenting votes in the official statements, even when more spirited discussions are noted in the minutes after the fact. How do you avoid groupthink uh, and avoid a higher risk of a policy mistake. Thank you. So I, I think if you listen to, and you all do, listen to my, uh, my 18 colleagues on the, on the FOMC, you'll see that we do not lack for a diversity of voices and perspectives. We really don't. And it's one of the great aspects of the Federal Reserve System. We have 12 reserve banks around the country where they have their own economic staff not the people who work here at the board. They're different people, and, you know, and, and so each, each reserve bank has its own culture around monetary policy and its own approach and that kind of thing. It guarantees you a, a, a diversity of perspectives. So I, I think that the perspectives are very diverse. But uh, and, and in, terms of, in terms of dissents, you know, I, I, we have dissents, and, and, you know, a thoughtful dissent, uh, is, is a good thing, it, you know, if someone really makes you think, that kind of thing. But um, I, all I can say from my standpoint is I try, I listen carefully to people, I try to incorporate their thinking or do everything I can to incorporate their thinking into what we're doing. And I think many people, if they, if they feel that's happening, you know, that for most people, most of the time, that'll be enough. And But I, I'm, I'm not, um, I mean... It's, it's not, you know, frowned upon or illegal or against the rules or anything like that. It just is the way things come out. And, uh, I mean, I think we have a very diverse group of branded people, frankly, more diverse than it used to be in many dimensions, more diverse from the obvious, you know, gender and demographic ways. But it also we have, we have um, more people who are not Ph.D. economists. So we have people from business and, and law and academe and things like that. Uh, so I think you actually do have quite a, quite a good diverse perspective. The con I think all of us read these stories about a lack of diversity, and we look around the room and say, "I don't understand. I really don't understand what they're talking about." So, but I, I get the question though. Thank you very much. The chairman of the Federal Reserve. That news conference ended almost as soon as it started. The Fed chair <laughs> thinks we're restrictive. Here are the scores for you in the equity market on the S&P 500. Boom. Vertical, almost straight away as soon as he started speaking. The equity market positive by 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq up by 1.1%. The small caps bouncing back from a very, very bad April. Here in May, up by almost 2%. If you switch up the board once again, if it's a Fed decision day, apparently it's a rally for the two-year. Yields are lower by seven basis points, 4.96.22. And I think it's about 4.20 a.m. in Tokyo. Dolly Yen looks a little something like this. I imagine the Ministry of Finance is a little bit happier. It could have been a whole lot worse. Dolly Yen, 157.49. Take a listen to what the chairman of the Federal Reserve had to say. I do think the evidence shows, you know, pretty clearly that policy is restrictive and is weighing on demand. And um, there are a few places I would point to for that. You can start with the labor market. Um, so demand is still strong, uh, the demand side of the labor market in particular. But it's cooled from its extremely high level of a couple of years ago. And you see that in, in job openings. You saw it, uh, more evidence of that today in the JOLTS report, as you'll know. Uh, it's still higher than pre-pandemic, but it has been coming down both in the Indeed report and in the JOLTS report. That's, that's demand cooling. Neil Dutt of Renaissance Macro with this line. The statement retains its easing bias. Powell believes the policy is restrictive. Look at the price action off the back of this, Bramo. The next 60 minutes of that news conference, next 50 minutes, hardly worth your time. Well, especially because the next question was the question that was uh, the key one, popping the question that Julian Emanuel was talking about, which is, have you considered a hike? What, how big is the threshold? 
Not likely. We're not going to do that. So it was a one-two punch. First, policy was restrictive, dovish. Then hikes are not on the table. Even a bigger rally. And frankly, that's what's fueling. Basically, hawkish isn't as a vocabulary. And Goldman Sachs in their note, Hot Season Company in their note, started with the tapering action. I think it was a tandem. I agree with everything you've said. And it was over, John, after uh, not 40 seconds. I think it was over after 33 uh, seconds. But with that said, he delivered a lot of what people wanted is an adjustment. You saw it in the real yield. It's come back a little bit. But you wonder what the follow is, the follow on is. The first set of Fed speakers out of the block? I mean, I mean are, they gonna, are they gonna go with this tone? It's been a fantastic lineup of guests over the last couple of hours. Just a shout out to Bob Michael, <coughs> JP Morgan, and Mohammed Al Arian. Asked about stagflation. Do you remember Bob's response yep. to that? I think the chairman's gonna laugh at that. Reflect on what happened in the Volcker years. I think he's going to laugh. He said there's no stag, there's very little flation. Ultimately, there's no <clears throat> stagflation. Basically, he laughed. He said, you know, give me a break. This is not what we're talking about. Honestly, this was a Fed chair that came out much more dovish than anyone had expected. And honestly, this raises a question about whether he is right. entertaining some of the key debates. He was asked by Michael McKee about long-term neutral rates, not going to engage it. Asked about long and variable lags, sticking to script. There was no sense that he had entertained a lot of the fundamental debates that are dividing Wall Street in a really serious way. And I'm not sure where that leaves people. I noticed that off the GDP, where we've got a 1.6% statistic, what we heard interview after interview was domestic final sales was actually pretty buoyant. And that's what he alluded to when he went after the stagflation. Let's be clear, they're not going to cut any time soon based on what we just heard. The easing bias remains. It's just the amount of price action we've seen over the last couple of months. When we talked about the Fed chair being hawkish, it was hawkish relative to what? We've had this conversation all day. Relative to the previous meeting, maybe? Relative to the price action, where we're priced for right now? Very difficult to do. The bar for that was so high, given the fact that this market is only priced for one cut in 2024. Yeah, this didn't push against that. I mean, this could very much be consistent with only one rate cut. And that's why you're seeing a bigger move, arguably, in stocks than in bonds. Basically, this is the perfect mix for stocks, where people said you just need the tail risk of a hike off the table. He did that. And then you can really go to the races. When we get to Dudley, I'm going to talk about what wasn't talked about too much, which is the labor economy. What evidence? do they need to see in the labor economy to really become accommodative? And to me, that's still really unanswered. I don't think it's claims. Maybe it's wages coming down a la Tom sure. Purcelli and others. But I, I just really wonder what the labor dialogue is here rather than the parlor game of what inflation is. TK, you're right, but I would pair that with inflation. I think oh, that's yeah, really got important. Well, they have to would these hot inflation prints temper their ability to respond to adverse right. shocks? The so-called Fed put. Based on what we just heard in the last 60 minutes, the Fed put is alive and well. Basically, stagflation's not on the table. Stop it already. And that's can, basically what we heard. Can you set up a course where we have Frankfurt and London question quality brought over to Washington? Can you arrange that? Would you like me to offend everyone? No, I, I, I'm going to say it right now. There are too many questions that are off topic of the dual mandate of price change. Ethan Harris on fire on LinkedIn on this and on the labor economy. I didn't hear enough about the labor economy. I, I have to admit, I disagree with you. You're I going to defend the press I want to Ramo defend disagrees it. With me. That's I a felt bad. like after the first two questions, people tried every which angle to get something more. It wasn't happening, period, full stop. He was going to say what he was going to say, which is essentially we haven't shifted our stance that much. We're not going to hike rates. Goodbye. See you next time. Let's they speak to a man who's been on the other end of some of these questions. Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president and Bloomberg Economics senior advisor. Bill, what did you make of that performance in that news conference? I think your interpretation is exactly right. It was quite dovish. I mean, he basically said that despite the news that's come in, economy stronger than expected, inflation not so good in the first three months of the year. The whole game plan is basically unchanged. We're going to keep rates here uh, until we're highly confident that we're going to get inflation down to 2%. No hint whatsoever of a rate hike. Uh, no hint that it's not going to work. Uh, so market reaction, I think, was pretty appropriate, given what he said. Uh, you know, he basically said, we, we, we've got it. Back to Dudley McKelvey of a few years ago. Bill Dudley, you're in the trenches at Goldman Sachs gaming the labor economy. What data in the labor economy is important to Chairman Powell to really become accommodative? Well, I think it's the, the notion that the labor market is really starting to some, somehow fall apart and uh, the unemployment rate is starting to rise significantly. He was asked pretty explicitly about that. And he basically said one or two tenths of a percent rise in the unemployment rate wouldn't really disturb him. 
Uh, you know, I think the interesting question is, if the labor market really starts to deteriorate, uh, you know, the problem is that the next stop typically is a, is a, is a, is a recession. Uh, we've never had a half a percent rise in the unemployment rate without having a recession. So I think it's, you know, if the unemployment rate goes up a couple of tenths, I don't think it really bothers them. But if it feels like the labor market is really giving way, then the Fed will put a lot of weight on that, almost regardless of what inflation is doing. Bill, you said something. He basically said, we got it. The playbook hasn't changed. Was that the right move? Well, time will tell uh, if, if the playbook is it will actually work as, as well as, as, as he thinks. I mean, my own personal view is that the lags of monetary policy probably are not, not as long and, and variable as he thinks. And I put a lot more weight on financial conditions, I think, than he is currently. Uh, the fact that people are taking his comments uh, in a very positive way from, 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 from a fi financial market perspective means that we're having an easing of financial conditions, which will support the economy. Uh, so I think it just reinforces the, the higher for longer story over the, over the medium term. He doesn't seem perturbed about that. And he also didn't really deal with a lot of the fundamental questions, as we were just saying, that have been dividing Wall Street. He didn't address the higher terminal rate. He didn't address this question of what would make him uh, really uh, second guess the whole idea of restrictiveness or long and variable lags. Do you think that means he's not thinking about it or that he has rejected it? Or do you think he just doesn't want to deal with it in the public right now? I think he's certainly thinking about it. But I think he's basically saying, from his perspective, the evidence hasn't convinced him that they're on the wrong track. So he, he thinks policy is restrictive, sufficiently restrictive to do the job. So maybe our, our star, you know, maybe the neutral rate is a little bit higher, but it's not as high as where they are today. So yes, could, could our star be revised up at the next uh, su June summary of economic projections? Probably will be up, revised up a bit. But it, policy in his mind is still sufficiently tight that he's not worried about that particular variable. Bill Dudley, Ethan Harris has been on fire, retired from Bank of America, out almost daily on LinkedIn with really intelligent work on trim inflation means. Which inflation statistic is most informative now to our audience? Well, I like to focus on uh, services X housing uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, this is the problem where the wage inflation drives the actual outcome in terms of services inflation. Uh, and number two, uh, you know, it, it's not being bounced around by, you know, the supply chain normalization process, which is pulling down its good prices. I think one of the things that's probably distorting the inflation news recently is the fact that goods prices came down a lot because of the normalization of supply chains. But if we ignore the transitory inflation on the way up, we also have to ignore it on the way down. So we don't want, we don't want to overstate that goods price inflation weakness. Uh, so I think services sector, X, X housing is probably a really th important thing to focus on. And, you know, that's the so-called last mile of inflation. And that's the, that's the part that's turning out to be more difficult. Bill, we need to talk to you about the balance sheet as well. So the Federal Reserve announcing today they'll slow the pace of balance sheet runoff starting in June. The central bank to lower the Treasury runoff cap to $25 billion from $60 billion. Bill, market participants right now trying to work out, OK, if QT wasn't bearish, is tapering QT bullish? But can you help me understand? Because we were told it's like watching paint dry. It has been. When they start to undo it, unwind some of it, what does it all mean? I think it is like watching paint dry. You can see that in the press conference today. There were virtually no questions about the balance sheet. Uh, and he made it very clear that the balance sheet decisions are not a, 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 a part of the monetary policy you know, process of, of making policy either, either e easier or tighter. Uh, I don't think it has much effect, uh, the, the taper, because the, the destination is the same. The Fed's going to a balance sheet size uh, that generates reserves that are ample, but not abundant like they are today. Uh, so may, we may get there slightly uh, over a longer period of time because we're now running off securities at a somewhat slow pace, but we're going to the same place. And so it really has virtually no market implications. If you were on the Fed still, Bill, would you have voted for this type of thing? Or would you have erred a little bit more, as you were talking about before, about financial conditions easing too much to allow inflation to stay sticky for too long? I don't think we're at the stage where you know rate hikes are warranted, and so I, I would have agreed with the decision today. I think where I would have uh, maybe bit differed from uh, Chair Powell a little bit is I would just be a little bit more cautious about the confidence that he that he's got it. Bill Dudley, thank you, sir. The former Fed, New York president. Bill, fantastic <clears throat> as always. Your equity market fades a little bit. We're up by three quarters of one percent. Lisa, I appreciated the question at the end of the news conference. I'm not sure about the answer. Because effectively what the journalist in that news conference was asking is whether the lack of dissent spoke to a lack of diversity of thought on the FOMC.
Correct. He was, they weren't asking about, you know, what gender and Precisely. What, you know, racial composition is on the Fed. They were asking about pushback, intellectual discourse, and this question about whether anyone was saying, hey, wait a second. Maybe we shouldn't be so sure that long and variable lags have the same kind of effect as they have in the past. That, I think, is a legitimate question. He didn't address a bunch of questions. Out here alluded to, and I think Bob Michael's been leading on this, and I mentioned Ian Lingen earlier, what if we get friendly data? What if we revert to a disinflationary vector? John, I'm doing some research here, and I mean, you know, I look at the G7 meeting in Puglia. Trying to make that here happen. Here in June, and yeah. I'm sorry, I got a plane ticket of $3,006, not even close to $7,000 eight, nine, ten months ago. I'm sorry, you get whispers of service sector disinflation, and you're right back to the boom economy, Dow 500, what it was ten minutes I'll ago. I'll repeat the question I asked a little bit earlier before the news conference started. I'll ignore the reference of the Dow. The three-month average on payrolls is 276. The Federal Reserve Chair has just established, conveyed quite clearly, that the Fed put is alive and well. They're willing to respond to adverse shocks, downside surprises, particularly if they emerge in the labour market. Now, I'm trying to wonder, Lisa, what it would take to reintroduce the rate cut conversation. Clearly, they still have a bias to ease, to cut interest rates. Would it be a downside surprise on Friday? Would that be sufficient? What would we need to see to get people talking about a different thing, not about hiking, about being sufficiently restrictive? After what we've just witnessed in that news conference, what would it take to have a series of guests to start talking about July at the Federal Reserve? And Jay Powell himself might have said, well, it would take a substantial weakening in the labor market. Does this market believe him that it really would? Or do they think that just the idea that, yes, quits rates are increasing, see a slight increase in the labor market? And then to Mohammed's point, if you already see the weakness, it's too late. How much does that haunt him at a time where he's really embracing the recovery that we continue to see in the economy? Mike McKee was in that news conference. Mike McKee has run out of that news conference. He's with us right now. Mike, great exchange with the Federal Reserve Chairman in the last hour. What stood out for you? Well, I think that the biggest thing is that there are two audiences here or t uh, two people that or two things that the Fed is trying to address. One is the markets and their perception of what the Fed is doing. And the other is the economy and what they need to do to bring down inflation. And the two things are not always compatible. And that's maybe what you have right now. Uh, the Fed is less concerned about how the market feels about all this than they are with setting their own parameters within their meeting of what they think they need to do. And at this point, they don't think they need to do anything. The economy seems to be in good shape. Mm. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a slowdown, but we're supposed to see a slowdown when they raise rates. We have seen inflation stall out. Maybe that means they haven't got policy tight enough, but now financial conditions have tightened, and so maybe that's going to start to work. Bottom line, they don't know what they're going to do, so they can't then right. give the markets a good clue. Mike, in the fan distributions of all this data, the probabilities, the outcomes of all this data, is there in place into the jobs report on Friday an ability to get back to a disinflationary vector quickly? Uh, probably not, in the sense that we don't have any indication that hiring is going to significantly slow uh, meeting any of the conditions that Jay Powell was talking about for a rate cut. And wages from all the other measures we've seen have still been running above inflation. So at this point, one indicator isn't going to do it. It would take much more than that. Uh, if we got a significant rise in unemployment for some reason, then that would set some antenna up, but uh, it wouldn't push anybody to do anything at this point. Mike, we talked a lot about how the key question was going to be whether they were entertaining the idea of rate hikes. Were you surprised that he completely dismissed that outright? No, I wasn't surprised because, uh, Lisa, you just have to play game theory and ask, what would have happened if he didn't dismiss it? Then all of a sudden you've got people really moving the markets around, trying to price for something like that. Uh, at this point, uh, the Fed doesn't see a reason to raise rates because they think that overall the economy is slowing a little bit as they want it to, and it is doing so without uh, rise in unemployment, so things are kind of working out the way they had planned. Mike McKee, great work as always, buddy. We'll catch up with you tomorrow morning. Mike McKee there, breaking it down for you down in Washington, D.C. That pop in the equity market, getting sold just a little bit. We're still yeah. positive, but Tom, only by 0.4%. Yeah. Can I go to November 7? 
November 7 is two days after a modest election. I'm sorry, but that's the meeting I'm focused on. November 7 could be wild. Hey, he was pretty direct nuts. about it in the news conference. They do not want to talk about politics at all. Not part of the conversation. And they want to give the sense that they truly are independent at a time where they're actually being challenged in terms of their independence. The more people start talking about, when people, I mean the former President Trump, comes out and starts talking about the potential for, you know, taking ownership over Fed decision making, yeah. they're going to be that much more adamant about being I'm waiting for him to address that story that came out from the journal in the last week. Still anonymous sources around the President talking about these issues. These are big issues. Don't you feel like people are kind of like spitballing out there and seeing how the people react to Trouble it before loose. they, yeah, yeah, before they really kind of put any emphasis behind it. Jeff Rosenberg's got things to say about this. Joins us now from BlackRock. He really doesn't. That. Stick with us, Jeff. I'm not going there. <laughs> Don't worry. Jeff, it's great to catch up with you as always, sir. After what you just Likewise. heard, does it make you incrementally more bullish in any way, shape or form? Well, let's just say that going into this meeting, there was a lot of bearishness and fear that he would come out uh, more hawkish. If you even look at, you know, Bloomberg Economics uh, put out their kind of preview, it was overwhelmingly expecting a very hawkish message. So I think there's a lot of relief here mm -hmm. that the chairman stayed true to what we've seen from this chairman. He's been very much on the other side, has been one sided, looking at the glass half. Uh, full and 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 reiterating, you know, kind of the key point around an asymmetric response function. If inflation is higher and it has been higher over the last three months, okay, we won't cut as soon as we were anticipating. But the questions and people <clears throat> who tried to pigeonhole them on, are you going to hike? Did you talk about hikes? Right. You know, just deflected all of that, and that was a that was a relief. So the reiteration on the asymmetry, as a result of the reiteration on they. They believe that policy is sufficiently restrictive. Those are two key things here that keeps a more dovish orientation in the face of some challenging economic data. Jeff Rosenberg, on planet BlackRock, is the economy doing okay? Is the real misestimation here a 1.6% GDP, which made a lot of news, but domestic final sales were much, much better? Is it better out there than we actually think? And that's why we're heard of dovish Powell today? Well, I, I think you have a mixture there, and you've heard it, you know, as part of the exchange during the Q&A. Uh, you know, in the aggregate data, yes, 1.6 understates it, because as you rightly point out, if we look at domestic demand, it's running at a stronger level. So the economy in aggregate terms is stronger. Uh, but what Bob Michelle talked about in the earlier, or Michael, I'm not sure which way you pronounce it, uh, <laughs> talk about uh, is, you know, there are pockets. Was and, that some black rock shade? Yes. Is that what that was? That was 100% black rock shade. Morgan. <laughs> I can confirm it's Michael. Carry on, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there are pockets. Pockets of, of hurt going on here, but there are also pockets of strength. So you have a distributional aspect in terms of what's going on in terms of the economic growth side, but clearly the amount of slowing, it was a question in the Q&A, didn't you need to have more pain to get the disinflation? Good news is we're still on the path of the immaculate disinflation, and the growth side is, is holding up. So I think that's quite supportive here to the risky asset perspective. It seems like this is more supportive to the risky assets than it is to uh, government bonds, right? I mean, this basically raises the specter of taking a, a rate hike off the table, which will benefit stocks of companies that have done really well with respect to earnings, but doesn't necessarily give that much of a boost to government bonds that are still subject to higher for longer. Is that kind of your view in terms of positioning on the heels of this, on the margin? Yeah, and, and you know, I think we have to segment between the front end of the curve and the back end of the curve. Uh, when, you know, I think this is challenging for the long run in the back end of the curve, right? The Fed is, is from the most part, dismissive of the inflation increase. They're not really taking it in too much into account. The characterization of it was, was bumpy, what me worry. So that's fine. But if you're holding 30 years of debt at interest rates that, you know, may not sufficiently compensate you if you are at a longer period of a 3 percent inflationary period, that's a bit challenging and a little bit problematic. I think for the front end of the curve, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit easier story because you have less exposure because of the maturity and roll down that you benefit from there. Uh, but I think you have to be a little bit concerned about the longer run 
trajectory here, both from what we heard today in terms of monetary policy, but the other side of this, uh, which we heard a little bit this morning in terms of Treasury refunding on the fiscal side, that's a bit more of a challenging environment for back-end duration. Hey, Jeff, I want to build on that just a little bit. Given how established the reaction function is now at the Federal Reserve, highlighted again by the chairman in this news conference, how do you think yields will respond to the longer end to incoming information, the data on Friday, an upside surprise versus, say, a downside surprise? Yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna to pivot right to Friday, and uh, we'll be back, and we'll talk to you guys then. But, you know, I think that will very much be more about the front-end reaction, uh, because that's going to be about, is the Fed really getting the slowdown in the labor markets, uh, the, the, the normalization in the labor markets that they keep talking about, but the data isn't really supportive. Non-farm payroll is not supportive. Wages not supportive. Right. I'm a little surprised you didn't get more pushback on ECI, their favorite measure. Everybody expected it to go down. It went up. Yes, we can dismiss it. It had special factors. It was a bit more state and local. It was a little bit more union than, than private. But it didn't go down as fast as the normalization would say. And there is that kind of lurking question. Mike McKee, you asked it. You know, are you not as restrictive as you think you are? And they'll continue to believe that they are restrictive. That's kind of the fundamental uh, uh, belief at this point. The question is, if the data keeps pushing against that, then does the Fed have to make a bigger pivot? Today was not that day. Way too soon mm -hmm. to get there. And that's why Powell purposefully came out very dovish. But inside the statement, one thing people, one questioner picked up on, there are a little bit of hints here of, of, of moving around. The removal of the of kind of the implicit forward guidance on the peak policy rate, the implicit promise that the next move would be a cut in the introductory statement. Um, I think that's notable. We'll see that in the minutes in terms of the debate. And what, we, what the chairman obviously couldn't talk about here, but next month we will talk about, is the shifting in the distribution of the voting members with respect to right. their forecasts of economic policy. <laughs> that you didn't get this meeting, but obviously that's what the markets wants to see. And you can kind of read into the statement and the, and the press conference that there is a shift going on there. It was underplayed. Not really many people picked up on it. He wasn't going to highlight it, but you can see that is going on. BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg. Great to catch up with you, sir. The shade of J.P. Morgan from BlackRock. <laughs> oh, stop. Do you think they call Rick, Rick Ryder? <laughs> You know, over, at, over at J.P. Morgan. It's a fair mischaracterization. You think that was intentional? That was your takeaway from Absolutely all the Fed coverage? Absolutely was that intentional. With Bob Mich Are you Michelle? joking? Oh, of course goodness. it was. Uh, they don't know who Bob, Bob Michael is. Give me Jeff. a break. This <laughs> S&P 500 is fading going into the close. Let's bring up the chart briefly. We're up now by only a tenth of 1% at the peak. In that news conference, the S&P 500 was positive by 1.2. Something that sticks, though. Interestingly, here, Lisa, it's the, the rally in bonds. The two-year is still down by about eight basis points. It took the prospect of hikes off the table, so that potential uh, tail risk not necessarily there. I thought what Jeff Rosenberg said, though, about the long end was interesting, and we're not seeing it in the price action at all. Same. But that in the longer run, this becomes a real problem for the long end. Essentially, if you have a Fed that is hardwired to cut rates on any weakness, but not necessarily to hike rates on the sense of any kind of durability of inflation, does that mean that inflation is going to stay higher for longer and that there needs to be a higher risk premium? I was pleased you took the conversation there, Lisa. This from Mohammed Al Arian out on X, formerly known as Twitter, X, with this to say, the question now, this is an important one, which will only be answered in a few weeks when the meeting's minutes are released, is the extent to which his remarks reflect his own biases or constitute an accurate summary of what was discussed by him and his FOMC colleagues. And the Fed speak's going to start pretty immediately, Tom. Almost straight after this, going into payrolls, we're going to hear from Fed officials. I agree. The Fed speak's important. If we get a 240 on survey on non-farm payrolls, three months trailing, 240, 303, 270. That's a fully employed America. Well, and you raised a real interesting question, which is essentially, is there now a new asymmetry in the market where the long end will sell off disproportionately if we do get a really big or hot print in the labor market? Essentially, the Fed's not going to look at this as a reason to hike or even to keep rates higher for longer necessarily, but it could mean longer term there could be a much more inflationary pressure under the hood. Really important stuff ahead of payrolls on Friday. As Tom mentioned, the estimate in our survey, 240,000. The previous number, 303. Coming up next, on the close, counting you into that, about 15 minutes away, Seth Carpenter, Chief Global Economist at Morgan Stanley. For the three of us, we'll see you again. Same time, same place, for the next Federal Reserve decision. From New York City, this was The Fed Decides.